Today's episode of the Majority Report is brought to you by season two of the podcast Blowback. It's exclusively available on Stitcher Premium. After a critically acclaimed retelling of the Iraq War, season two of Blowback, co-hosted by Brendan James and Noah Culwin, who was on the other day on this program, is a 10-part account of the unlikely story of the Cuban Revolution. It's a nuclear-tipped showdown between the Kennedy brothers, Fidel Castro, the Soviet Union, the CIA, and the Mafia. To listen now and get a free month of Stitcher Premium, go to stitcher.com slash premium and enter the promo code MAJORITY when you select a monthly plan. That's stitcher.com slash premium, promo code MAJORITY. Now, for this show. The Majority Report with Sam. The destiny of America is always safer in the hands of the people than in the conference rooms of any elite. Sam Cedar. They are unanimous in their hate for me, and I welcome their hatred. We must guard against the acquisition of unwarranted influence, whether sought or unsought, by the military-industrial complex. The Majority Report with Sam Cedar. <laughs> and I get the feeling you've been cheated. It is Tuesday, May 18th, 2021. My name is Sam Cedar. This is the five-time award-winning Majority Report. We are broadcasting live steps from the industrially ravaged Gowanus Canal in the heartland of America, downtown Brooklyn, USA. On the program today, journalist, Steve Charles, professor of media, cities, and solutions at Temple University, host of BET's News, Black News Tonight, and author of Except for Palestine, The Limits of Progressive Politics, Mark Lamont Hill will be here. Also on the program today, Joe Biden finally calls for a ceasefire as Israelis continue to pummel Palestinians over 200 Palestinian civilians killed, including over 60 children. That's the Supreme Court. Dobbs v. Jackson's women's health could be the case that cripples Roe v. Wade protections. U.S. announces it will ship 20 million additional vaccine doses abroad. These are FDA approved as opposed to the AstraZeneca, which we've promised, but have yet to approve. New report, Trump's DOJ tried to force Twitter to reveal the identity of Devin Nunes' cow, that anonymous handle that mocked Devin Nunes. In fact, there was a subpoena that was revoked until uh, or revoked once Biden got in office. Meanwhile, congratulations. Andrew Cuomo, it's revealed, is set to earn five million dollars from his covid leadership book. Congratulations. Not in the humor section. The National Labor Relations Board examining possible election infractions by Amazon at the Bessemer uh, warehouse in Alabama. And new report, uh, people who work over 55 hours a week have a, a big increase in stroke and heart disease risk. South Carolina governor assigns a bill forcing death row inmates to choose the electric chair or firing squad all this and more on today's majority report ladies and gentlemen thank you for joining us uh welcome to the program with me as always emma vigeland emma how are you i am well how are you sam i am good just expecting just waiting for that one day when you say like eh, fair well i i guess i am fair today well come on yeah, it's too late. Okay. You're locked in to good. 
we'll take that. And then if you want to say you're fair a different day, you can do that. But I'll, I'll map it can't, out. Can't switch it up. Yeah, right. Now that I remind you that you could be fair. Um, we got a lot to talk about today. Uh, thanks for joining us. Um, let's get uh, right into uh, this here. Um, still have a horrible situation with Israeli warplanes, um, their supposed precision-guided uh, weapons, um, killing well over dozens of children now, uh, over 200 uh, civilians. Um, there have been limited civilian casualties. I don't know that there's been any in the past couple of days uh, on the Israeli side. The Palestinians don't have the ability to guide uh, their weapons. Um, we will talk about that uh, with uh, Mark Lamont Hill because that has implications in terms of the International Criminal Court, uh, which is examining, and even prior to this conflict, although I imagine they're going to take it up dirt for this conflict as well, human rights violations uh, and war crimes charges against uh, both the Israeli government and Hamas. So we will we will talk about um, uh, that um, in in just a few. But here is Anthony Blinken. Um, he is in Denmark, and uh, he's being asked uh, about uh, what the U.S. is doing to slow things down. And this is um, remember the U.S has stopped at least three attempts by the UN for what it's worth. But I mean, there's only so much that other countries can do theoretically uh, for calling for a ceasefire. The, the, the Biden administration just announced a day ago that they're going to send $730 million uh, worth of, of weaponry to Israel. But here is Anthony Blinken just talking about it as if it's, it's all happening. There's no there's no active role for anybody to take. The United States remains greatly concerned by uh, by the violence, by the escalating violence. Hundreds of people uh, killed or injured, uh, including children being pulled uh, from the rubble. We're also alarmed by how journalists and medical personnel have been put at risk. Um, Palestinians and Israelis, like people everywhere, uh, have the right to live in safety and security. Uh, this is not an Israeli privilege or a Palestinian privilege. It's a human right. Uh, and the current violence has ripped it away. So we've been working intensively behind the scenes to try to bring an end to the conflict. First off, why has it taken over a week for the U.S. government to say that Palestinians have a right to safety and security. To even mention them. To even say the word Palestinian. Um, and this notion that we've been working quietly behind the scenes, well, I, I mean, it seems hard to believe that's the case, but let's assume that it is. It's been incredibly ineffective and the sort of public and I guess you could say it's also behind the scenes um, earmarking of seven hundred thirty million dollars worth of uh, weaponry. It seems to like I don't know, maybe you're not using your maybe not putting your best foot forward. Yeah, maybe not putting the screws on if you come from these behind the scenes negotiations and the result is that we're going to give Israel more weaponry. As if they need more. Um, I thought about this the other day, and we had Jeremy Scahill on to talk about Biden's foreign policy history. Back in 2001, after George W. Bush publicly said something critical of Israel, or criticized their um, assassination of some Palestinian uh, militants, Joe Biden said, my view has always been that disagreements between Israel and the United States, those differences should be aired privately, not publicly. 
So that does inform a little bit of what they are saying, right? They're standing with Israel publicly and behind the scenes. They're apparently dealing with this conflict. But the proof is in the pudding of what those private dealings have created, what created what the yield has been. And it's been a continued emboldening, emboldening of the Israeli government to continue to indiscriminately um, commit war crimes, b b shooting down buildings that contain um, press outlets. I mean, they attacked uh, Palestine's only coronavirus testing center and their health ministry. So none of these supposed private dealings are doing anything to help at all. And I think that's by design. Two of uh, the uh, Gaza's uh, top trauma doctors also killed in the bombing. Um, and and as you've mentioned, Israel has the ability to target their their strikes. Palestine or Palestinians, Hamas, whatever, they don't. So this is deliberate when they're going after these kinds of this this kind of infrastructure. And uh, there's only uh, now a. Um, a couple of days worth of fuel and they're anticipating widespread power outages in Gaza. And we should say they've, it is, um, it is, that is normalcy where they have limited power uh, on any given day. So um, it is, it's just a horrible situation there. And uh, the Biden administration just seems to be dragging their feet, hoping this whole thing goes away and um, I think it is a it is a different era. And so um, but we will be talking to uh, Mark Lamont Hill about that in a moment. We're going to take a quick break. We'll be right back. And when we uh, do come back, we'll be talking to Mark Lamont Hill, author of Except for Palestine, The Limits of Progressive Politics. Meanwhile, a couple of words uh, from our sponsors today. Um, one of our. Um, one of our sponsors, uh, we've talked about in the past, uh, GiveWell.org. Since 2010, GiveWell.org has helped over 50,000 donors find places where their donations can save or improve lives the most. Giving to a uh, an effective charity, you got to do some research. Well, uh, that's the whole point of GiveWell. They've done the research. They give. Uh, they have recommended charities. They have rigorous academic independent studies of the effectiveness of their uh, programs. Um, and GiveWell dedicates over 20,000 hours a year to researching charitable organizations, and they handpick a few of the highest impact evidence-based charities. Donors have used GiveWell to donate more than $750 million. These donations save over 75,000 lives and improve the lives of millions more. And here's the best part. <clears throat> GiveWell is free. So GiveWell doesn't take a cut of your donation. They allocate your tax-deductible donation to the charity you choose. So they're just basically a portal, and they have done all this research for you. Plus, they publish all of their research on their site for free so donors can understand their work, their methodology, and their recommendations. For me, there's a couple of charities I found uh, through GiveWell, but the one that I really um, have been consistently uh, giving to is, and I don't think it's related, although it's the first name, is Give Directly. And they basically, you, uh, you, you give them a dollar, and 87 cents of it, I believe it is, or 83 cents of it, goes directly into the hands of people they're trying to help. And one of the things, there, there's been a tremendous amount of evidence over the years, particularly during uh, COVID, frankly, that um, the best way to deal with uh, poverty, poverty I I I including like extreme poverty, is uh, just to give people money. They know how to spend it the best. And so um, I found Give Directly through there. There's also um, uh, a couple other charities that I've gone through, but Give Directly has been the one that I've sort of consistently um, uh, been giving, and I found it through GiveWell. So if you've never donated to GiveWell's recommended charities before, you can have your donation matched up to $1,000 before the end of June or as long as matching funds last. Just go to givewell.org slash majority. 
pick podcast and the majority report at checkout and they will match you up to a thousand dollars uh that's givewell.org slash majority make sure to select podcast and the majority report at checkout and get your donation matched also uh today's program sponsored by uh well you can you can tell me uh what it is what do i have every morning usually in my jab cup magic spoon magic spoon bingo magic spoon has amazing flavors you love but without all the bad stuff zero grams of sugar 14 uh, 13 to 14 grams of protein only four net grams of carbs in each serving only 140 calories a serving it's keto friendly it's gluten free it's grain free it's soy free it's low carb it's gmo free we got exciting news magic spoon has released a super delicious new flavor birthday cake what like I have the birthday cake ice cream flavor i guess i have no idea i've not that's tried a, this that's a weakness of mine uh you should try it out birthday yeah. cake magic spoon will soon be available in a special five pack for a limited time only so get it while you can emma or you can build your own box available flavors to build your own very custom bundle cocoa fruity frosted peanut butter and cinnamon i would go with like a one cocoa one peanut butter three cinnamon that's the way i roll peanut butter is really good too yes if you're listening from canada magic spoon now ships there as well uh folks my kids me it is uh, become a staple of my breakfast and frankly um when i'm here i am i'm hitting like a little uh, you know somebody asked me last time do i do the the uh, serving size and i just i don't know what do you mean do you do their serving size well you know like the serving size is a certain amount and i just keep filling up this uh, jeb cup and it's like a snack for me go to magicspoon.com slash majority report to grab the new limited edition birthday cake or custom bundle of cereal to try it today be sure to use our promo code majority report at checkout save five dollars off your order this offer is now good anywhere in the U.S. or Canada. Magic Spoon is so confident in their product, it's backed with a 100% happiness guarantee. So if you don't like it for any reason, they'll refund your money. Remember, magicspoon.com slash majority report and use the code majority report to save $5 off. Lastly, are you hiring for spring? What kind of role are you hiring for? Maybe you need to hire somebody who wears many hats around this place. Everybody around here does like 14 different jobs. That can be challenging. Maybe you have a simple position to fill, but it's taking forever to find somebody who's a great fit for your company. That's where ZipRecruiter comes in. I've talked about ZipRecruiter for years now. I've used it. That's how we got Brendan. And the best part about ZipRecruiter is not only it's not like just a, like a regular job posting board they go out and find candidates they found uh brendan invited him to apply for the job and it was a perfect match zip recruiter can help you find qualified candidates fast and now you can try it for free at ziprecruiter.com majority maybe you need to hire a civil engineer in new york maybe you're in nebraska pediatric nurse an attorney in Colorado, doesn't matter. A mascot in Missouri, a producer in Brooklyn. ZipRecruiter's matching technology finds people with the right experience for your job and actively invites them to apply. Like I said, that's what they did with, uh, with Brendan. We got a bunch of good candidates at that time. And I'm telling you folks, the best time to do this is when you don't need to hire somebody. Go out there, see what's out there, figure out how the best way to um to find the person you're looking for it's so effective that four out of five employers who post on zip recruiter get a quality candidate within the first day from accountant to zoologist and everything in between that's a to z i don't know if you picked up on that oh yeah zip recruiter makes hiring easier and right now you can try it for free at our only our listeners get it link that is only listeners of the majority report. You ready? Yes. ZipRecruiter.com slash majority. ZipRecruiter.com 
slash majority. If you go to ZipRecruiter.com slash majority today, try ZipRecruiter for free. We get credit for friending, sending you. That's the way it works. Once again, that's ZipRecruiter.com slash majority. M-A-J-O-R-I-T-Y. ZipRecruiter.com slash majority. Um, also, just want to remind you, it is your support that makes this show possible. When you become a member of the show, you support the free half. You get it free of commercials. And uh, you also then get the fun half. And I want to take this opportunity right now to um, play a shofar for one of our fun half uh, regulars. Haven't heard from him in a while. He hasn't been around his computer because I think he's... he's You're going to need to tell me who this is before It I is uh, Lawyer Matthew. Ah. Oh. But Lawyer Matthew may not be Lawyer Matthew for much longer. <gasps> he has just been uh, nominated a Democratic Party nominee for town justice in his town. Wow. <laughs> So he could end up being Judge Matthew. We'll see. Um, Justice. Justice Matthew. We might do that. All right. Are we uh, waiting on uh, um, our guest? All right. Let's uh, let's take a um, uh, just a, let's play some music for for a bit, and we'll be back in just a moment. Well, folks, uh, live streaming, I guess. Uh, these things happen. We uh, do not have uh, Mark Lamont Hill uh, today. We will endeavor to get him a, another day. Uh, in the meantime, though, um, there's, we, have, we have news to, uh, to discuss regarding um, the ongoing, I mean, you call it a conflict, I guess, uh, but... Let, let's be honest what the dynamic is here. There is one 
side that has overwhelming force and is uh, pounding uh, the other side. Um, we mentioned earlier that there have been calls for the ICC war crimes uh, for the International Criminal Court to probe um, the Israeli strikes on Gaza homes. This is what I was sort of getting at earlier. The um, the the attacks uh, you you are not allowed under international law to have uh, indiscriminate killings of civilians, and it, it must there must be some type of argument that there is that these are um, unintentional and i guess i mean you know this the, this is the, the 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 parameters unintentional um uh killing of civilians that are simply collateral damage to a targeted attack on a military installation um because hamas does not have the ability to target their so-called rockets, which, you know, rockets is really a, um, a term that I think gives you an, an incorrect notion of what's going on here. These are essentially it's like generous. Well, it, it's, it's generous to the extent that of what these things are. They're like uh, very high powered um, fireworks. And of course, fireworks can be uh, lethal, um, but there is no real targeting capacity at all with these uh they don't have the ability to destroy buildings they can hurt people shrapnel can uh spread um and so there is uh there are concerns that if the icc looks at both sides here by the very nature of the weapons that are available to hamas they are only any civilians that are killed are done so in a random manner because they don't have the ability to target their weapons in the first place. So the structure of these investigations and these charges necessarily um, make it hard to imagine that the uh, criminal court wouldn't at least find, you know, both sides guilty of war crimes, which and again, we should be clear, this is really about world public opinion and about uh, creating pressure and having lived through the era where there were pushes to divest and boycott South Africa uh, over its apartheid regime. It, it, it takes a while for this to build, but... Um, it's interesting in just doing research on um, on Lamont Hill's book, and he, uh, we should say that he had written it with uh, Mitchell uh, Plitnik. Um, the 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 change in public po in public um, opinion, as evidenced by the number of Democratic politicians you have now on the right, there has been no change whatsoever, um, but. You now have Democratic uh, Party elected officials who are on the floor of the, the House uh, calling for ending financial support to Israel. You have them calling out the Israeli government for killing civilians. This just didn't happen six, seven years ago. Um, and... We have more widespread sort of popular culture appreciation for this. And I mean, on some level, there's still this dynamic uh, with certain cohorts of people. But the, 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 the phenomena of progressive except for Palestine is becoming less prominent. I mean, it just simply is. Um, and so uh, this is, uh, this is, I think, in my estimation, a, um, uh, you know, 
a good, uh, you know, a, a good thing to happen. It's not, it is insufficient, but it is necessary before we get to the point where there is um, bigger pressure on the leadership of the Democratic Party to start taking different positions on this. And, um, you know, they also make the point in that book that the things Trump did, for instance, the moving of the uh, embassy to Jerusalem, which we should say on day one, Biden said, we're not we're not reversing that. That uh, the authority to do that had actually been granted by Congress in the mid 90s. I think it was in 96. However. There was it was continuously since that time prior to Donald Trump, 30 years um, waived. The authority was waived each time. And so the authority existed. The apparatus was there. It was just that we ended up getting a president who was going to make use of that. And he did. And um, and that's, you know, that's been the uh, Israeli modus operandi for decades now. Facts on the ground become much harder to reverse. And that's what we have now. Here is, um, and, and, and we still see, you know, figures in the media, but it, they're becoming more and more anachronistic sounding, right? Here is uh, Jeremy Bash. Uh, this is the former chief of staff at the CIA and the uh, Defense Department under uh, Barack Obama. Um, he's on with Andrea Mitchell on MSNBC. And this is, now we're at the point where it's, you know, the idea that Israel needs to defend itself um, is not sufficient of an answer in this context because there's no, there's no existential threat. Is there a threat arguably to uh, some of its citizens? Yes, but it's not nearly commensurate with the threat that they, they pose towards uh, Palestinians. Well, what's, and if, what's repeated, though, is, well, Hamas, they believe in the extinction of the Jewish state and of Zionists, etc. My response to that is just because Netanyahu says it politely and the right wing government of Israel doesn't come out loud and say we want to eliminate and basically uh, commit cultural genocide against Palestinians doesn't mean that isn't the entire goal. Oh, well, I mean, of course. But when you are power. when you are dispossessing all of these Palestinians in uh, East Jerusalem, when you are uh, engaging in ethnic cleansing, when you are preventing them from having any legitimate sense of autonomy, you you are also denying the the, the Palestinians the right to exist. Um, and you know the the difference is maybe rhetorical, but beyond the rhetorical difference, you can simply see. Just by body count. The difference is power. Right. The you can see by the... body count. That's the only measure there. But all right, let's, let's listen to okay. Jeremy Bash. We've hit communities in Jerusalem. And so for the United States, I think the priority is to get pressure on Hamas to stop the rocket attacks. Of course, no one wants to see the loss of life. And the heartbreaking images from Gaza are terrible to watch. But it's we got to make clear in terms of our values, in terms of our morals, that the people who bear the responsibility for this are the Hamas terrorists who put rockets in kindergartens, in hospitals, under civilian places like apartment buildings. And that is the moral outrage that should come from Capitol Hill, from the UN and from the West. But let me just also point out to play devil's advocate here, the Israeli bombing is more or less indiscriminate. If they say that there's a Hamas intelligence office, they take down an entire tower of journalists in their offices. They gave them uh, notice to get out, but then argued against 10 minute extension that the owner of the building was pleading for to try to get the equipment out. So all of their equipment, their transmission abilities, their archives are gone forever. Yeah, I think, Andrea, there are three legs to the Israeli defense stool, if you will. One is their civil defense, their red alert sirens and their bomb shelters. 
The second is Iron Dome, their missile defense. And both are designed to actually give Israel some decision space before they have to launch, off, launch offensive operations. But they cannot degrade Hamas's infrastructure just passively defensively. They have to take targeted strikes against Hamas. And by the way, if they didn't, Hamas would just shoot more rockets at Israel. And so no military in the world, in fact, I was in the Pentagon during the 2012 Gaza war, and military leaders in the U.S. Department of Defense said to me, he said, no country in the world except Israel calls ahead and says, we're going to give you an hour before we strike uh, a, a terrorist target. We don't do that in the United States. We've never done that. Yet Israel does it because, precisely because, as I said, Hamas uses human shields. <laughs> This is, I mean, first off, there is no analogy. We do, we do not have an open air prison that we control the borders of. So just to say that analogy, I mean, this is they're they're shooting fish in a barrel. I mean, almost literally. And the idea that uh, we should give some enormous credit because they call an hour in advance and say, hey, we're about to take out this huge building so that really, ultimately, there's no media infrastructure um, is just absurd. But it's also just absurd that Andrea Mitchell can only come up with, well, what about this media? Like, OK, I, I mean, clear. Let's be clear what Israel's doing. Israel does not want images of the killing of all the children um, does not want images of the killing of all the children to be broadcast on the news. And so the, the, the idea that like, you know, the only way for Israel to defend itself is to, is to, is to kill all these civilians. It is just, first of all, it is not, there is, this is just, it's just absolutely utterly bizarre. If you want to protect your citizens, uh, how about not unjustly dispossessing and engaging in ethnic cleansing? Like, I mean, this is, uh, it is, I, 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 it's disturbing that there are people listening to that and actually buying what Jeremy Bash is saying. And I, I like the idea that, frankly, there should be only a, a representative from the Defense Department or the CIA uh, on a, a television program with no one there to refute, um, but except for a devil's advocate advocating on behalf well, she, of she, AP of the AP journalist, she was she was being cautious there. But like, say, I mean, so I mean, but that's just what I think is the difficulty surrounding um, this conversation. But I want to just get you know to the 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 meat of what Bash was saying there. One. Hamas is using human shields. That's his claim as to why it was justified to blow up an office building that contained Al Jazeera and uh, AP offices because there were Hamas militants or there were Hamas operations uh, happening in that office building. Blinken and the United and, and that they shared that inf intelligence with the United States. Blinken said that they didn't get that information or they didn't respond to quest request for comment there. So that has not been established uh, established whatsoever and you should never believe what the israeli uh government is claiming in this instance you should never believe what any government is claiming the second thing that uh pro-israel hawks like bash like to do is conflate hamas with the palestinian people that is like conflating the Likud party with the entire population of israel and the right-wing government of Israel, led by Netanyahu, commits terroristic acts just like they're claiming that Hamas does, right? And Hamas, yes, does in, in many, in, in some instances, in many instances, has targeted civilians and has killed civilians. But that's the, 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 that's the way they're trying to change the conversation here. They're trying to make the entire population of Palestine, all of the Palestinian people, and shoehorn them into this narrow definition As if they're of what all Hamas militants. says. The, yeah. Hamas is th their, th their arm, right? That's not what is happening here. Um, and then just the point about what kind of civilian killings get credence in these conversations and, and which ones don't. State violence done by an established country by Israel and them killing civilians, well, you know, that's just self-defense. But when Palestine does it, when Palestinians try to defend themselves and lash out 
based on the apartheid and the killing and the lack of clean water and the lack of electricity and health care and COVID vaccines and COVID testing, and then it hits an inflection point, that's what needs to be demonized, not the state violence that caused it at the beginning. And so this is the dance that we do all the time. And it's such a shallow, hawkish, racist assumption that just follows power because Israel has the power, Israel has the money, so their violence and their murder is way more legitimate and justified. And that's what the cycle of this conversation is. And it's maddening. I, I, the other thing that journalists, I think, should demand in this type of situation when there is a claim that this is a there was Hamas assets there, like I, I like like exactly what are we talking about? Right. I mean, like they, they, they are attempting to paint this picture that like they had some type of, you know, howitzer on the 15th floor yeah. and they were firing out of this building. Hamas is also the administrative state in Gaza to the extent that there is one. Yes, exactly. Right? I mean, so um, I mean, it would be the functional equivalent of Hamas saying, look, we're only ta- uh, attacking Israeli Israeli, not not the people, but the uh, governmental uh, apparatus, which is why we hit that bus stop. Right. That bus is uh, a it is really government bus. I mean, the uh, they need to be more explicit so that w- we and the world can make an assessment. As to whether that warranted the death of. The trauma doctors or whether that warranted the death of, uh, uh, c- you know, civilian children. It, and, I, you know, I'm going to tell you right now, I. I I don't know what it is that, that that would warrant it in my mind, but they don't even bring up that equation. They obscure that by this sort of like, like you say, this vague notion of Hamas. As soon as they say Hamas, it is just, it's a terrorist cell that's there as opposed to like, well, maybe uh, they had, I don't know, like the phone system to the extent that it worked was, you know, working out of there. Maybe parts of the internet uh, apparatus were working. I don't know, but we're not allowed to know because if we knew and by we, I mean, just to the general population, they'd be like, hey, wait a second. That doesn't make any sense at all. Um, and that is a, a failure of, and frankly, let's be honest, certainly not just a function of, of MSNBC. I mean, Mark Lamont Hill was fired from CNN for a speech he gave, not even uh, on CNN. Yep. And, uh, you know, Wolf Blitzer used to work for APAC. There is, a uh, there is a, a hegemony uh, in uh, broadcast media that I think is starting to erode when you have folks like Ali Velshi and uh, Maddie Hassan um, actually discussing these things in a. Um, and if we were a, having an honest, con- I'm sorry, so if we were having an honest conversation about Hamas, like. Is it a shock that the body that Palestinians have chosen to represent them are hawkish and want to retaliate against the <laughs> of uh, course against the the um, the government that oppresses them? But that just means they're terrorists, right? Like there's not even an attempt at shallow under a shallow understanding of what happens when you oppress a people for decades and decades and then they try to create their own leadership and then this is what happens and there's no fundamental difference between the there's no actual uh value difference in the bodies that are um well i mean i should say in terms of just like one life killed by the israeli government versus one life killed by hamas right but the devaluation of the bodies killed by the Israeli government is based on that notion of power and or lack thereof um, and, and racism and, and, and Islamophobia, even though, of course, not all Palestinians are Muslim. But that is at the root of a lot of it. And I, it's just yeah. here is um, Representative Elisa Slotkin. She is a um, Democratic congresswoman uh, from Michigan, I believe. Right. And uh, she, uh, New York. Oh, Elise Slotkin. Sorry. Yep. Yes. 
and uh, she's a former CIA Middle East analyst. And um, this is uh, she's on with uh, Poppy Harlow on CNN. I'd like to change topics, if I could, uh, Congresswoman, before you go and ask you about the ongoing violence uh, between Israeli forces and, and, and Hamas and, and what has uh, come out of a number of progressives within your party that would like to hear the Biden administration speak more forcefully against Israel. Than it has. And I thought it was notable that uh, the Secretary of State, Anthony Blinken, just a few hours ago, reiterated Israel's right to defend itself, as the U.S. has always said. But he went on to say, I believe Israel as a democracy has an extra burden to do everything possible to avoid civilian casualties. Your Democratic colleague in the House, uh, Rashida Tlaib, Congresswoman, tweeted this, Israel targeting media sources is so the world can't see Israel's war crimes led by the apartheid in chief Netanyahu. Those are incredibly strong words. Uh, what is your response to her? Do you agree with those progressives in your party on this? Well, listen, I mean, I don't think anyone likes to see what's going on on their televisions. It's devastating right now. And I'm literally getting texts and, and messages from people saying, please, like, please make sure that there's awareness on what's going on here, frankly, on both sides of the issue. I don't, I think that this issue, again, becomes something where we just sort of like play back and forth. It's like ping pong. And, you know, what, what I'm seeing right now is civilians losing their lives on both sides. What I see right now are people trying to defend themselves, first and foremost, in Israel, but also now inside of Israel. There are gangs and roving sort of groups of thugs that are threatening and, and beating people up. Up. I mean, it is devastating to watch. And I think the more we say you have to come down on one side or the other, um, the more we lose sight of like this systemic problem when people don't have a two state solution. So That's just, the just, to, just to be very clear for, for our viewers, are you saying then you you do not believe the Biden administration position and uh, word word choice should change it all here. You're comfortable with the statements coming out of the administration. I, I think I think people need to read them for what they are, which is Israel has a right to defend itself and the Palestinians have a right to live in security and safety and all human beings have dignity. And that, I believe, is what they're trying to say. That is what I am saying, certainly. And I think that's extremely lost in the debate right now. I mean, the, the, the idea that the critique is only about the rhetoric on both sides, that there is no addressing of the material realities. Look, the United States can try and pressure Hamas all at once. There is no, and, and to the extent that they can, they are. They are arming the Israelis. They are providing Israelis with Warplanes and missiles and guns and um, uh, targeting, all of these things have been provided by the United States uh, that is a acting as a, uh, a mechanism to attempt to discipline the Palestinian people. Let's be, let's be honest here. They've killed uh, more civilians than they have militants. And... Um, so it's and, and they have hit uh, civilian targets like we just saw with that building, for instance. There, nobody's expressed any military value there. Just the, the fact that Hamas may have had an office in there. Um, so the United States is certainly exerting influence on the Palestinian people. It is doing it through its proxy, uh, Israel. But it is not in it is not exercising any influence on Israel. None. None. It's and that is, well, that's the point is that like, you know, if you're, if you don't want to address this, if you don't want to address it, but you also realize that you have to address it, you talk about the rhetoric on both sides. Right. Or you talk about the rhetoric on one side because the rhetoric is irrelevant. The, the relevance is what can the United States do to influence the supposed outcome that you want in this instance? And it is quite easy. It can say to Israel, you cease your flights, you cease the bombing. Or we retract our aid. I mean, that's what your gets aid lost is tied in this to conversation. This. And I, you stop dispossessing uh, Palestinians. We sold them more arms. Yeah. We just sold them more arms. I mean, that's what like, like, of course, you know, honestly, that's better than what would have come out of an Elise Slotkin type six years ago by the way yes that's but true. but um 
it's of of course uh, woefully insufficient for all these reasons that you just stated um i've said this point before but i think it's it's a good lens to look at this through when you both sides this conflict right or conflict when you both sides this apartheid <laughs> and you make it as if there's just oh they can't get along two two sides that are just both fighting and there's you know you're, it's so complicated right it obscures the power dynamics in such a way that you're doing what right wingers did in this country talking about police brutality when you said black lives matter and you say all lives matter right right you are not looking at the issue you are actually sapping the conversation of the necessary context to move forward in a productive way and that's by design by people like elise slocken who obviously has a history um was what she was a cia representative in the middle east this is not going to be the person who's going to change the conversation around israel palestine but you know i mean that that that's what that that kind of talk is designed to do but it's given some sort of credence as if she's saying anything remotely substantive or uh relevant to to uh, addressing what's the root of what's happening there this is what's also uh, interesting that's happening uh, around the world in some places anyways um folks are familiar with the the bds movement it is the uh boycott divestiture uh movement um and in this country, there are 34 states, I think it is, that make it illegal for you to support this boycott or divestiture. I mean, it's always just sort of ridiculous to even articulate this, but it's the case. It will, if there is any evidence that you have done that in your private life, then you are ineligible to receive a state contract to work in any capacity for the state or with the state. So uh, this, there was a case in Texas where someone was a speech therapist and was coming in helping uh, children who had uh, special needs for, special th for, for speech therapy, school kids. But because they had expressed uh, in some venue support for boycotting Israeli products that were uh, made in uh, the West Bank, she was of Palestinian descent, I believe. Denied a uh, denied a contract. Um, I mean, the uh, it's just absurd. They tried to pass this in the Senate. Fortunately, it failed. Um, but it, 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 this is the sort of level of of in this country of selective, I guess, uh, application of of censoring that is that is okay. Uh, you don't hear a lot of those, uh, some of those uh, free speech, you know, uh, I don't, I don't recall that episode that Sam Harris did, for instance, on, uh, on uh, uh, criticizing the BDS. Maybe he did. I, I shouldn't point him out. Maybe he did. I just didn't hear it. Um, but the point is, is that, you know, all of these people are talking about uh, American values and whatnot. Meanwhile, around the world, there are unions who are beginning to show uh, some measure of solidarity with uh, the Palestinian people who are being subject to, you know, uh, a, a slaughter. And in Italy, um, Italian dock workers refuse to load arms onto a ship that uh, they were in uh, Naples and Livorno. Um, they would not load arms that were... Um, destined for Israel. Here is a um, speaker at a Palestinian solidarity campaign in uh, London um, calling on union dock workers to follow those Italian workers' lead. I've seen, we have seen the call responded to by dock workers in Italy. They have refused to load weapons due for Israel onto ships to use against Palestinians. I am calling to all of the unions in this country. The dock workers refuse to load the weapons. I am calling to the people that work in the factories. You have 10 different sites for Elbit Systems, the Israeli arms company in this country. Refuse to build those weapons of war. Thank you. 
refuse to comply. 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 Refuse. Um. So there's, you know, attempts to basically just sort of putting their, um, their, uh, you know, their their labor to use, or they're withholding their labor, uh, so that you know, literally, the 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 Israelis can't have the weapons to uh, continue to kill civilians. And you know, everyone knows. I mean, it's not like uh, you can't really say that this is collateral damage if everyone knows it's going to happen. And everybody knows uh, that the Israelis have said, had uh, many, many statements in the past. We're gonna put them on a diet. We're gonna mow the lawn. Every now and then you have to mow the lawn. These are just, you know, we've had these over the years and years. Uh, lastly, let's play this clip of Tom Cotton. And again, the salience of this is very different on the right in this country. Uh, than it is on the ostensible uh, left. It is changing, at least, uh, you know, and I'm talking center uh, left to left. Um, but on the right, with conservatives, there's no question whatsoever. They, they have no, there's no hesitation. And here is Tom Cotton g- skipping right over the fact that, like, wait, we haven't seen the military value of the supposed presence of Hamas in this building. He's skipping right over that to actually demonizing uh, the people, the other people who were in the building. Why is the Associated Press sharing a building with Hamas? Surely these intrepid reporters knew who their neighbors were. Did they knowingly allow themselves to be used as human shields by a U.S.-designated terrorist organization? Did the AP pull its punches and decline to report for years on Hamas's misdeeds? I submit that the AP has some uncomfortable questions to answer. This is Alex Jones stuff. I mean, was the AP aware that Hamas was in Gaza? Did they ever report that Hamas was in Gaza? I don't know. I mean, I would think that they were just there to... Why isn't the AP sending coordinates for every bombing run that the Israelis are going to do? They were covering traffic in Gaza. I thought that was really what the whole purpose of what the AP was there, not anything about the governmental structure there. I mean, well, the idea that journalists are there to be human shields for terrorists... Those are some brave journalists. (laughs) You're really going full uh, full on. My point is one, you know, okay, the U.S. designates Hamas a terrorist organization. I give zero credence to what the United States says in this conflict, by the way. But, I mean, um, take that point. Do uh, Say what you will with that, right? Um, what Tom Cotton is trying to engender is more vile hatred of the press as essentially terrorist defenders. I mean, take that that step further. It's a twofer, yeah. It's a twofer. But it, this goes back to why he's one of the most dangerous people in our government. Um, top three, I would say, right now, at least. He's got real fascist tendencies. Yep. Yep. Harvard educated, um, uh, but uh, very worried about the elite. I'm really uh, impressed by those AP reporters, though, putting their bodies on the line like that, uh, going undercover, covering for Hamas. Uh, my estimation of that organization has gone up a lot. They get Absolutely. some extra bonus pay uh, for that. <laughs> um, we're going to take a quick break. When we come back, we're going to change topics a little bit. We'll talk a little bit about this um, case, Dobbs v. Jackson's Women's Health, which is going to have um, could have serious implications for a woman's right to choose in this country. We'll be right back after this.
Okay, you may have heard the uh, news yesterday that uh, it, it broke sometime after we, or during uh, the recording of the show. I'm not quite sure when it was uh, yesterday. But um, the Supreme Court announced yesterday that it is going to hear Dobbs v. Jackson's Women Health Organization. You will, they will not hear this until October. Uh, so they're actually making a decision for the next term. I think their term ends sometimes in June and July is when all the... Depends on how many cases they have backed up. And uh, they'll hear this in October. They will probably come out with a ruling sometime around this time, actually, between now and June of, uh, I should say, May of 2022, June 2022, around there. It will be the first major case well, really, the first case that has a head-on attack at uh, Roe v. Wade. This is a um, a Louisiana, excuse me, a Mississippi law that prohibits nearly all abortions after the fifteenth week of pregnancy. That means prior to what the Supreme Court has considered viability. Supreme Court uh, considers uh, does not consider a fetus to be viable uh, until after sometime after week uh, 20, 23. Um, and this uh, Mississippi law prohibits all abortions after 15 weeks of pregnancy, except in a medical emergency or the case of a severe fetal abnormality. Um, the Supreme Court has said a state may not prohibit any women, any woman from making the ultimate decision to terminate her pregnancy before viability. This is a direct assault on uh, that precedent. The, we should just say, that a conservative uh, federal appeals court struck down the Mississippi law because of that existing Supreme Court precedent. The Supreme Court does not need to take this case. There are hundreds of cases that the Supreme Court can take any, any term. And there are certain situations where they're almost feel, they almost feel compelled to take it because maybe two... Um, uh, circuits disagree. So there's a disagreement on the highest level of the appellate uh, federal judiciary. But there are other times where the Supreme Court looks around at what's happening down below there and pulls one out and says, we're going to hear this. And that's what they did this time. Now, the last law that uh, came up, last case about Supreme Court, was a Louisiana law that was uh, what is known as a trap law. These are uh, targeted restrictions on abortion providers. And that is basically when they say like, okay, you can't provide abortions unless you have a 30, 40, a 30 uh, foot ceiling in the facility and where you're providing those abortions. Where, where it's a law that's like clearly has nothing to do with anything other than to restrict abortions. They struck down a Texas law uh, about three or four years ago, a trap law. When they heard this Louisiana law, John Roberts basically said, and then remember the Supreme Court at that time was 5-4. John Roberts basically said, look, uh, it's too close to the Texas law. Just by the principle of, of respecting precedent, we're going to reject, or I'm going to vote to find that this is un unconstitutional, this trap law. That was a couple of years ago. John Roberts has always signaled he wants to do this. And um, now you have Amy Coney Barrett on the, 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 the Supreme Court. And John Roberts has a free pass. He can vote with the so-called liberal wing of the uh, justices. Um, so Amy Coney Barrett's been getting a bunch of heat for there were other opportunities for the Supreme Court to take up cases that challenge Roe v. Wade. Um, and the right-wing, anti-abortion, anti-choice groups had been 
pounding the table, being like, what did we lobby to get you onto the Supreme Court for, Amy Coney Barrett, right? This was supposed to be um, uh, our, our, our issue here. And so now she's essentially caved to that, and it seems like they're going to... But this was always her I don't think cave was really the word. I think what it is is more... I agree, but I mean, well, I think she wanted to initially do this, but I think there is some trepidation, even by the most conservative Supreme Court justices, to touch this. This shows that she eventually now decided, okay, this is safe to rule on. Uh, the reporting is that uh, John Roberts, in the first year that uh, Brett Kavanaugh was on the Supreme Court, made sure that they weren't going to take any cases that were particularly controversial because he wanted to give a Kavanaugh an opportunity to sort of settle in. Sounds kind of political. Oh, yes. No, no. The, I mean, you talk to any expert on the Supreme Court, it's very political. There's no doubt in my mind that Roberts did not want to have a case come up this year. Remember, if you take this case in November... After Amy Coney Barrett's on, a, any case, you take it in December, it could be resolved this term. Yeah. John Roberts, very conscious of his legacy as the um, chief justice. There is no doubt in my mind that it was expressed at one point. Let's give it a cooling down period. Let's not make it like the court is simply a political vehicle. However, Ian Milheiser is reported on uh, Brett Kavanaugh. He had a piece that came out today. There was a couple of um, of rulings that um, Brett Kavanaugh has written. One was um, the uh, about children whether they can minors can go to prison for life. That's uh, um, Jones v. Mississippi. Um, there was. Um, a another uh, case, um, Edwards v. Vinoy, which dealt with this change and whether it was retroactive. The point being that there were m two precedents involved in this case that Kavanaugh just basically blew through. Right. And the way that Supreme Court justices work is they use different cases to build different rubrics of ultimate of of future decisions so this case will show how we can go about overruling precedent in this way that case will show how we can go about overruling precedent in that way and so when we come to a case that is very controversial and we're going to overrule precedent we're not taking this uh, methodology for the first time. We have already like, created a precedent of overruling precedent. Yes. And, and the, that's what's happened. And the point, too, about this is that this Mississippi law was not their first attempt to get the Supreme Court to take this up, right? There have been a variety of Republican state legislatures that have passed similarly restrictive laws that are illegal, and they were doing so so they would get to the Supreme Court. They've finally broken through. Yeah. And so uh, this is going to come up in uh, the spring of 2022. And uh, we'll probably hear oral arguments sometime around in October of next year. And, um, you know, this is uh, this was to be expected. I mean, this is this was one of the greatest dangers of Donald Trump being president was what he did with the judiciary. And he did it. It was uh, predictable and it is sad. But that is our time for today. We will be back uh, tomorrow with more. Uh, until then, if you're watching us on Peacock, we will see you then. And for those of you who are not uh, watching us on Peacock, we will see you now. Um, we're going to be joined in the fun half by Nomiki Konst of the Nomiki Konst Show. Whoa. Uh, Nomi will be here soon. Just a reminder, it's your support that makes this show possible. You can become a member at jointhemajorityreport.com. Jointhemajorityreport.com. Uh, also, don't forget, justcoffee.coop, fair trade coffee, tea, or chocolate. Use the coupon code MAJORITY, get 10% off. Oh, did you see that when I came in, when you came in? No. Yeah, somebody sent me a Japanese Flobie. Oh. Yep. I don't even see what you're pointing to. Oh, it's on the couch? Yeah, it's a Japanese Floby.
Maybe I'll bring it up. Maybe I'll show it uh, in a second. I'll go grab it. Are you uh, going to film yourself cutting your hair on the... Well, I don't know. I'm starting to like my hair long. I don't know if I'm going to... But it also you can also cut uh, the, the hair of a dog. So that's oh. uh, on the picture of the box. Okay. Well, yeah. I mean... So uh, uh, Ronald Reagan sent me that. Uh, of course he did. Yeah. Well, uh, you don't have a dog to cut. No, but I may get a dog hair. just to uh, cut the, the hair with the flow beat. But uh, the point is... I don't know what the point of that was. I don't know why I brought that up. But uh, JustCoffee.coop, fair trade coffee, tea, or chocolate, use the coupon code majority, get 10% off. Don't forget, they am quickie, folks. Check that out as well. Uh, where's Nomi? Let's, uh, let's bring her in. No. Hi. Hello. <laughs> you always surprise me. You always surprise you. What? <laughs> It's it's the way it comes in. It's not like, you know, some grand announcement. It's just like, boom, you're in. Hi. And then you have like two seconds to change your name. <laughs> you get some highlights? They look good. Thank you. I want a little blonde. This is a, the first time I've done this. So thank you. Good. You know, I'm sick of cover. It's, it's, it's the grays. Sam knows. <laughs> oh, Sam does, definitely knows. <laughs> I'm going to give away the secret. I'm sick of it. <laughs> uh, oh, I May have to do that with my hair and do a little more highlights in there. I, mean, I put in a little bit. Well, I think you have the highlights. I have a little bit of the highlights. Uh, yeah, I put them in a little bit. Um, so uh, who's on your show today? Great question. Uh, so this is an interesting show today. We have uh, Napoleon DeLegend and Joshua Con Russell are on for our panel. And then Craig Unger, who is the author of American Compromat. Uh, I know I'm going to get a lot from people about this, but oh well, how the KGB cultivated Donald Trump and uh, related tales of sex, greed, power, and treachery. I think it's very juicy. I'm excited for this one. It's like reminiscing on uh, old times. There you go. Um, I'm really interested in this, uh, 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 just how uh, corrupt Bill Barr was during mm. this era. Uh, this latest report, we'll talk about that, about him. Um, the DOJ going to Twitter and trying to... <laughs> name of Devin Nunez's cow uh, Twitter handle. That to me, <laughs> I find stunning. But um, <laughs> Matt, what's happening on in the Matt Leckian universe? Uh, yeah, two pieces of content last night. Derek Davison, uh, David Griscom and I talked about Joe Biden's foreign policy. Uh, that's uh, released for patrons only. So patreon.com slash left reckoning if you want that. Derek is one of the best uh, eyes on foreign policy there is. Uh, and also last night, I Twitch streamed uh, Rocket League. I did pretty well, I must say. Um, scored a f quite a few goals, including an overtime game winner. Um, crowd what was is, is that a soccer game? It's like a soccer game, uh, but except instead of playing with a guy, you play with a little like remote control car. And it's like you... Demolition Derby, but with soccer goals in a giant like Thunderdome. Yeah. Oh. It, it's a lot like, but you, but like hockey people keep telling me like hockey terms, like you I don't, I don't, I can't even remember them, but I never played hockey, but I'm learning it pretty well. It's what do you mean? Pretty so hockey terms like you score? Like, or... No, like stay in your lane or I don't, that's not it, but like the, oh. it's the equivalent of that. The offense. Dump and chase. Fill the gaps, I think is what it was said. Tim Hortons. All right. All right. They always sponsor hockey. There yes. it is. Twitch.tv slash literary hangover. I'm going to be doing Monday nights uh, at 11. At 11 p.m.? Oh, yeah, because I have to watch Go Off Kings first. Jeez. All right. God, I love that lifestyle. I can't. I'm too old. I, get, I fall asleep at like 930 now. Uh, let's take a quick break. Head into the fun half of the program. Jamie and I may have a disagreement. Yeah, you can't just say whatever you want about people just because you're rich. I have an absolute right to mock them on YouTube. He's up there buggy whipping like he's the boss. I am not your employer. You know, I'm tired of the negativity. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to upset you. You're nervous, you're a little bit uh, upset, you're riled up. Yeah, maybe you should rethink your defense of that, you fucking idiots. We're just going to get rid of you. All right. But dude. 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 Uh, you want to smoke this joint? Yes. <laughs> Do you feel like you are a dinosaur? <laughs> <laughs> 
That's a good shit. Exactly. I'm happy now. It's a win-win. It's a win-win-win. Oh, hell yeah. Now listen to me. Two, three, four, five times. Eight, four, seven, nine, oh, six, five, oh, one, four, five, seven, two, thirty-eight. 56, 27, one half, five eighths, 3.9 billion. Wow. He's the ultimate math nerd, don't you see? Why don't you get a real job instead of stealing vitriol and hatred, you left wing limbaugh? Everybody's taking their dumb juice today. Come on, Sammy. Dance, dance, dance. Grandpa. I had my first post coital scene with uh, a woman. I'm hoping to add more moves to my repertoire. All I have is the dip and the swirl. Fine, we can double dip. Yes, this is a perfect moment. No. Wait, what? You make under a million dollars a year. You're scum. You're not paying. Excuse me? Fuck you, you fucking liberal elite. I think you belong in jail. Thank you for saying that, Sam. You're a horrible, despicable person. All right, going to take a quick break. I want to take a moment to talk to some of the libertarians out there. Take whatever vehicle you want to drive to the library. What you're talking about is jibber jab. Classic. I'm feeling more chill already. Good. Donald Trump can kiss all of our asses. Hey, Sam. Hey, Andy. Are you guys ready to uh, do some evil? Hitler was such an idiot. You think I might be a Nazi? Agree. No. Death to America. You. Yes. Wow. Wow, that's weird. No way! Unbelievable. This guy's got a really good hook. Throw our hands up. <laughs> wow. Um, but Sam, I gotta get off. No worries. Let's, let's, I want to just flesh this out a little bit. I mean, look, it's a free speech issue. If you don't like me... Hey, 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 shut up! Thank you for calling into the Majority Report. Sam will be with you shortly. Uh, so here it is. Um, just uh, going to show this. Uh, this is my Japanese uh, Floby. I, I, I don't know what it's called because I don't speak Japanese. Um, Put the pictures of the, um, the users closer to this, the camera. Uh, can you see that? Yeah. Siri, how do you say Floby in Japanese? There is a um, there's a dog and a guy and a little kid, and so uh, it, you get the option. You know, it's too bad because First salt. Of all, I like how they don't suggest it for women. <laughs> uh, it's, Your hair is supposed to be long and luxurious in Japan. Come on, um, men and boys, and uh, it's too bad because Saul just uh, got his hair cut and he he does not like it. Oh, why? Uh, too you know, short. He said it makes him look like a dork. Oh. And uh, and uh, I have been cutting his hair through COVID. It's the first time he actually went and got a haircut. Oh, so. And I do a much better job. I do it long. I, I leave it long. So you just cut off the ends or in the back? I, I, get, I get a razor and I just uh, mm -hmm. do it like that. And uh, he's satisfied with it. But now he feels like he's a dork. Oh. And so he is um, wearing um, hoodies constantly. Won't take his hood off. There is nothing like when you're a kid and you get a haircut that you don't like. The kind of shame that you feel. I wore a paper bag on my head for two days. <laughs> what? Two days. Yep. What kind of haircut was it? Too short or what do you call? I don't remember. I, I, you know, I have no idea. I was just convinced it looked bad and I wore a paper bag on my head like I walk into stores with my, my mom. <laughs> Seems like incredibly overly dramatic. Yeah, that was... Uh, Why not a hat? Charlie Brown over here. Yeah, I don't know. You I, just wanted to make a point, honestly. He yeah, was the paper bag a cliche at that point, or was that kind of still new back then? Um, <laughs> <laughs> you mean just the existence of a paper bag? <laughs> no, the paper bag over the head, right? I mean, I'm pretty yeah, sure as a cliche, like 90s, like sixties at sports games, but were you? Oh no, no, how old I mean were you then? Uh, the. Um, I know I was probably like six or seven, so it was probably like early seventies. Mm -hmm. And um, this is pre the unknown comic on the Gong Show. Yeah, none of us. Oh, got well, that, that place is it. <laughs> <laughs> so, in other words, happy birthday to me! I just uh, aged ten years in talking about that. Um, where did I uh, go with my 
sound sheet. Okay, here we go. Um, let's, uh, let's, let's, uh, we're getting closer to the uh, mayoral race in, in, in New York City. We're not going to spend too much time on this. People were like, why are we hearing so much about this? New York's an important city in the country. I'm sorry. And Andrew uh, Yang is running in it, and he and ran for president. We're in, yeah, and we're in New York. And um, so, you know, we follow this. We'll just do it for a couple of minutes. Uh, the new polling has come out. It's all over the place. It, it seems like the polling is all over the place to me. And like, and, 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 um, but there's uh, Adams, I think it was, and uh, Yang and Stringer. Stringer Yang are tied. Uh, yeah, I mean, but they're they're all effectively tied, right? I mean, on some level, is Adams really that much I'm further? I'm looking up? at it now. Uh, Emerson College polling from May 15th, 2021. Adams at 18%. He went down by one point. Stringer at 15%. He gained. Yeah, well, what's uh, the margin points. of error on these? I mean, it's like they're oh, 3.8%. Hold on, I want to get to the kicker. Yang at 15%. This is percent change from March 6th. Minus 17 points. Yeah, I mean, that makes sense. No, I'm just saying, though, yeah. that's significant. There's What's the polling? Um, how many people were polled? Uh, Emerson College, uh, 631. Uh, margin of error, 3.8%. And Gar so, and, un but in the, and, and the unknown, on uh, decideds yeah. are 20, 30? Yeah, 27, 30%, if I remember correctly. Garcia has like 7.5 percentage points, if I remember correctly, as well. It's Maya, a, Maya Wiley dropped, even though I thought she killed in the debate. So it is literally all over the place. place. Yeah. And, and people have to remember, too, it's ranked choice voting. So even that polling, even if that polling was super accurate, it still doesn't tell you the whole picture. Because if you've got three people tied for first, the real question is, who's their second choice? And that's going to be Adams, I feel like. Um, and, uh, you know, so... Uh, I don't know. That's interesting. But you know, it's so funny. We we like fought for ranked choice voting so hard, and I don't even have one person I want to put on that ballot. Everyone's like, "Who are you endorsing?" I it's it's not ranked choice. It's it's like zero. I have zero choice. It's <laughs> rank isn't the smell. Um, I am going to probably vote put Stringer at the top based on because it has to be strategic. Well, here is a, a clip of uh, Diane Morales, and this is, um, uh, wow, this is a uh, February 2020 interview. And um, for those people who are contemplating, like, she is the, uh, you know, sort of a uh, progressive uh, option, um, you might want to think about that again. Uh, here is uh, a podcast um, the Max and Murphy podcast. I'm not quite sure. Uh, Gotham Gazette. Uh, okay. Yeah. Well, I mean, well, I shouldn't say that. Um, Max is from Ben. Max is from Gotham Gazette, editor in chief. Here we go. For Democratic voters that you're going to be trying to appeal to, can you give folks an early sense of sort of where you fall in this uh, supposedly big tent party? Um, are there ways that you talk about what kind of Democrat you are? Should people know who you're supporting in the presidential race? You know, are there some yeah. markers you can give folks? Yeah, you know, I've been asked that question a couple of times, and I've been really resistant to the label, um, mostly because I don't check all the boxes in any one lane. Mm -hmm. um, I think, you know, people have tended to want to lump me in the sort of progressive or the democratic socialist, uh, but then we talk about schools, um, and we talk about school choice um, and then they go, oh, you, you know, maybe not. Uh -huh. Right. Um, because I do. I am a strong believer in school choice. Um, and that's definitely a much longer conversation sure. um, that I'd love to be able to unpack. Um, but so I don't I don't fall neatly into any one category, mm -hmm. I don't think. And um, and I'm, I'm hoping that that's actually going to be pretty appealing to New Yorkers. Just quickly on that. Do you have a, a favorite in the Democratic presidential primary? Um, I am honestly going to vote for whoever the candidate is, the nominee is, um, and I haven't quite made up my mind okay. yet. And were you supporter of Governor Cuomo or Cynthia Nixon in 2018? Um, I, that's a good question. I uh, I think I voted for Cuomo. Okay. Sheepishly. <laughs> Final question for Jared. Oh, we don't she didn't seem too interested in who is governor. Uh, that's a sort of a weird position to take uh, 18 I months out I from uh, from from being uh, the mayor. Um, and incidentally, school choice. I mean, 
I'm for school choice in the sense that, like, if you, um, you know, when you apply to middle school in uh, in in New York or uh, or high school, you 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 rank the choices that you have. You look at different schools and you say, I'd like to go to that one or that one. But that's not what she means. <laughs> what she means is privatization. She means privatization through charters. Um, and, uh, and that's what she says when she says school choice, um, which everywhere is conservative, but in New York has been a battleground between the Cuomo and Bloomberg types and pretty much everybody else, like on the scale of New York city elected officials, those who support school choice are the Eric Adamses of the world. They're the far right of the, cause there's no Republican party in, in New York city. So let's just say like, it's the, it's the supposed progressives progressive institutions and like the Democrats who are all for privatization, all for business coming in, all for real estate developers, all for cops. And 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 so, in other words, when Ken Langone has a uh, briefcase full of money, uh, he'll go visit uh, Andrew Cuomo. And then all of a sudden, Andrew Cuomo becomes a huge fan of charter schools. Uh, that's basically how that works. Ken Langone being a Republican. Let's just oh. also make that clear. <laughs> and so, uh, but that is... Um, that's bound to hurt Diane Morales as well. And uh, Garcia just got, um, uh, I guess, a uh, endorsements from like the Times and somebody else, right? Um, uh, recently, so yeah, Daily you know, news, yeah. It was yeah. Daily News and, and New York Times. What I think that is is I think it's like a weird. Um, I could be wrong about this, but because of ranked choice voting, I think people. So Eric Adams has a problem with people like like people and in institutions journalists he has rubbed a lot of folks the wrong way um he has his own little machine but yet he is obviously polling much higher so you think to yourself this is Bro this is the brooklyn borough president he has extraordinary name recognition uh, at a moment where the city is having you know a security whatever his I'm, i don't agree with it but like you think that like being a former cop who was beaten by the cops wanted to reform the you know the police force that he would have caught fire earlier because he does have management experience and it just shows i think that he's much 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 weaker and the new york times which um i feel like they wanted to send the, the signal out there that you have to get somebody who has management experience when the city is in a total downward spiral i don't think that they think Catherine garcia is going to win i think it's more like Hint, hint, nudge, nudge. This is the case for these other people that we really don't want to endorse for other reasons. Scott Stringer, Eric Adams. I could be wrong about that. Um, but, you know, and the Diane Morales thing, just, just one more note on that. I'm sorry to, to kind of go back to it. But I've had a lot of people like friends of mine who support her and are working for her. And I think it's great. And I think her platform is fantastic. But I think as progressives, and I'm really glad that you brought this up, Sam, we have to actually like delve a little bit more into who somebody is. And there have been plenty of situations. I mean, in the race that I was in, there was a person who some progressives jumped on board with. And I was like, she's supported Hillary Clinton. She's for privatization. On stage literally said there's nothing wrong with the real estate industry and was trying to, you know, they come out with a progressive platform to create wedges. Sometimes people are running not to win. Sometimes they're running to create wedges or to be cover for other candidates. When you have a lot of people in a race, it's multi-dimensional politics. Then one gets out and endorses the other, and suddenly the momentum is behind that person. It's I I I, I think she's she did great in her debate. I think her I hope that her politics are that left moving forward. Um, but I always was a little bit cautious. Yeah, I mean, and particularly when you think about um, New York City. I mean, there there's actually uh, maybe this is not uh, fair, but education is where the money is spent. I mean, it, it, I mean, it, it, there, there's obviously, you have a city this size of this many people, there's a lot of different things going on. Housing is hugely important. Um, and uh, policing is hugely important. And education uh, is, I think, actually the biggest uh, line item in the budget, if I'm not mistaken. Um, and so the idea of those resources going to um, privatized um, schools at this point is um, highly problematic, it seems. And the fact that organizations that are supposedly progressive supported her and have endorsed her is mind boggling to me. I mean, that's the dilemma though, right? Because they've got to do, they've got to support somebody. There's, and, there's people in the race that don't support charter schools. No, I understand. No, I, I understand. I'm, uh, I, but the, the, it is, you, I mean, it's hard to know whether maybe that's been traded away or not. I don't know.
right? Like you're going to get our support, but guess what? That position you had about uh, privatization of schools, you don't need to bring that up anymore. Well, and that's also, you know, the teachers unions and the unions that supported Scott Stringer are, are adamantly behind him right now. They're not backing down. In fact, some of them made, some of the leaders made really uh, questionable comments about believing women, uh, which didn't get enough attention. You know, th this goes back to also like how strong our progressive organizing is. And are we willing to put to go all in for one candidate, meaning Scott Stringer, when Scott Stringer has been around for a long time? People know who he is. Right. Um, there were it was beyond just women. It's treatment of, you know, trust me, there's just a lot out there. And yet we didn't cultivate alternatives in a ranked choice system, like true alternatives, you know. There, I mean, Helen Rosenthal could have, I, I could blame 15 progressive people that could have run. And it would have helped Scott Stringer if they wanted to back him or would have helped the others. I mean, it's a true ranked rank choice system. There are plenty of strong progressives with experience that could have run in this race. And they didn't uh, because they were told not to. Um, let's turn to uh, the back to national news. Uh, mask situation in this country. CDC seems to be sort of like, uh, they're not saying that, you know, they're saying that you can take your mask off if you're vaccinated. You don't have to. Um, there's just seems to be a sometimes like a, a, a difficulty at the CDC with trusting the American public with any type of nuance. And I can understand it on some level because there is a huge portion of our society that seems to be dedicated to the premise that we need to find a problem with anything that shows collective action has value, right? I mean, that's what this is with the masking. They put it in the terms of control. The only reason why the CDC wanted us to wear masks was to exert control because there are people there who want to discipline us. And, and it's like, when you, when you really stop and think about that, you realize how just sort of like, demented that theory is that a there there aren't other ways that they could exercise control over us they do that every day and there is a certain amount of control there is a certain amount of your freedom that you have to uh give up as a member of society because you necessarily have to worry about the people around you i mean it's it is when they talk about control what they are afraid of what they're pushing back against understand this they are trying to attack the idea of collectivism the idea of collective action of societal action they are half a step away from being climate change deniers they are a half a step away maybe half is, is an exaggeration i mean that's where that's where we're at with this i mean so people should be very clear about it when you see people I mean, it's one thing to say, like, I disagree with the CDC. I think from, you know, you can have a nuanced conversation about it. But when, you, when you're doing this just to take a position and you're claiming it's about control, understand they are attacking the idea that society can function in a way as to uh, create some type of, of, of response to an issue that only society can address. Here is Dave Rubin. Um, or uh, with his boss, Glenn Beck, on The Blaze. And look, in this instance, it's Dave Rubin, it's these two clowns, but understand, there's a lot of other people who could be sitting in these seats who have been, you know, who, who project a more serious quality about them. But here are these two. The absence of a mask on somebody has become almost like a yellow star. Mm-hmm. Uh, so many people on the liberal side see the mask as a sign that you're part of the party. And when, you, when you're not wearing a mask, you're a problem. And they've been shaming us. They've been side-eyeing us, uh, speaking out, calling us names. How do they remove that mask? Because it has become part of the identity of the party. Well, Glenn, that goes directly to the danger that they've been doing for years now, which was calling us all racists and bigots and Nazis. And I know that you personally, you, Glenn, you've gotten into hot water from the, the lefty media at times for making the Nazi analogy. 
and and I completely agree with you on this. They are that when you make the Nazi analogy, I mean, the irony is these are the people who call all of us Nazis, but the Nazis didn't just show up one day. It didn't yeah, just show you. up one day. Oh, it is a, yes, it is a process of othering people, saying the worst mm -hmm. things about people. And now it's not just that our political views are odious and should be silenced and kicked off big tech and everything else. It's that we are literally killing people by not wearing masks, by not bowing to these people. Mm -hmm. And and who is who's actually the ones that are instigating the hate? It's it's them. Well, this is so demented. In so many different ways, it really is stunning. First off, just for folks who know absolutely no history, the yellow star that Glenn Beck was referring to was um, in no way analogous to the idea of saying, I'm not going to take a, a wear a mask because you didn't get to choose whether you were going to wear a yellow star. It was a way uh, for the Nazis to establish that you were a Jew in public so that you would be then otherized. It wasn't an option that you had where you could say, like, I want people to know that I'm a Jew. And incidentally, there is a difference between being a Jew or doing something that has the potential of endangering other people. They're the ones who are making not wearing a mask an identity. I have no idea what, like, the, the way I would describe a non-mask wearing person is you're a non-mask wearing person. There is no, uh, but for them, it's an identity. For them, it's some type of performative action that is supposed to be out there. They are doing, they are taking an action. They're, they're, you know, this is like, uh, you know, like rebellion, though, Sam, that's what this is about. It's rebelling. Well, so much of their identity is wrapped up in owning the libs. We've talked about this so many times. That is the core driving, irksome, uh, insatiable anger that festers in their bodies when they think about politics. It's not about improving people's lives. It's about this like cultural uh, this part of culture, this way of understanding that they want to rebel against inherently because they don't feel like they have control over it. And um, yeah, pretty sure, pretty sure, Dave and Glenn, if uh, the mask wearing was akin to the yellow star and we were moving towards fascism, which you, by the way, support, um, people who were afraid for their lives would put on masks because, as Sam said, it's voluntary. Well, and, and here's the thing. One of the other things that was sort of a, a hallmark of uh, the yellow star was not just that you would get the side eye or that you'd be shame, ashamed or, or calling that you, names. Your feet would that, be hurt. Yeah. It's that ultimately you were put into uh, cattle cars and sent to uh, death camps. That's the other part. But that's what Dave Rubin is saying is the end result of this situation. As Cuomo and Newsom are announcing plans in their evil blue states to relax the requirements of mask wearing. So there's a real shelf life for this Nazi scaremongering that they got. Well, but then now they saved us from the fascism that was the having to. I mean, look at it. Look at it this way. What if it was littering? Like the idea is exactly the same dynamic. Yeah. Can you imagine if these two were on there going like, I took a wrapper and I threw it on the ground and then someone looked at me side-eyed because that's what they're trying to do. They're trying to otherize us just because I don't believe in putting garbage in a garbage can. Yeah, I mean, what's, again, the, the snowflake mentality of a side-eye being the equivalent to persecution, but that's just exactly what they believe. And that's weren't they the same guys who were mad when... Liberals were comparing Trump to Hitler. Well, think about this. It's it's all, think about it. It's every single line of their attacks right now is about persecution. They're being canceled. They're being forced to wear masks. They're being forced to, to learn about racial history. I, 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 I it, it, the fact that Fox News has spent so much time in the last few weeks talking about how schools are talking about racial injustice and systemic issues, and they and they have people who used to be the the spokespeople of the Republican 
Party under George W. Bush saying things like, well, racism didn't exist, slavery ended, racism doesn't exist. And they're making themselves out to be the victim. That is their new line. They're the victims. They're the victims of the socialism. Uh, it's not new, though. That is honestly. No, but it's all they have now yes. because that's the difference. Well, that's the thing. They ran out of policies during the Trump administration. They ran out of stuff. They, 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 they stopped, like, even playing the, you know, uh, 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 providing the facade. And now it's just, like, complaints. Here is Dave Rubin, who in, um, and this is just a clip of his, um, who is sitting there with his boss. Um, who will never love and accept him because he's a gay man. Glenn Beck, exactly. Sitting there with his boss, comparing the treatment of people who don't wear masks to Jews in the Holocaust. That was, that was the clip we just played. Right. No, I know. Oh. I thought there was some sort of repeat thing happening, and I was like, wait, is this but, like... <laughs> here, he is. here he is. In one moment, he is a, uh, a Jew living in the Warsaw Ghetto, right? And I'm going to fight back against this. But then in another moment, he's like, well, but I mean, if it's, I'm going to get a citation, then forget it. Here he is. This is clip number 12. This is just him on uh, yesterday. You know what? I'm going to make a commitment. Starting today, everything that I do in L.A., and again, I don't go out that often, but everything that I do, any store that I enter, I'm not going to wear a mask. And if I'm told to wear a mask, then if I need to get in there, I guess I will. Like, I'm not here to start a riot and fight with people. <laughs> so on Saturday, the guy is comparing this to like, I, uh, this is like, the, this is like the, wearing a yellow star. And then on Monday, he's like, I am made a commitment. I'm not going to wear a mask unless I'm asked to. <laughs> the other question I have is like, why is he staying inside so much? I mean, I know he's got a beautiful house, but, but why isn't he going out and partying? Is it because he's afraid of breathing other people's COVID? No, it's because he's afraid people are going to stone him to death. Well, he's in California. He's okay. Until he... No, exactly. That's well. Maybe they won't recognize him. I the one time I have seen him out in California though before. Fun fact. Where did you see him? Waiting for an Uber outside of a outside of a studio. So. Oh wait, I also <laughs> saw him in a green room one time. That's such a sweet little moment uh, that shows the principled nature of Dave Rubin. Exactly. <laughs> I like how he's like, because on Saturday he has this conversation with Beck where he's like, it's like the Holocaust. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What we're going through is like the Holocaust. And then he must have thought about it. He slept on it Saturday night. Sunday he's like, God, I really need to stand up and fight like like they did in the Warsaw Ghetto. Even if it means my ultimate death. Oh, yeah, like, oh, oh. A week before January 6th or so, he was saying, guys, watch V for Vendetta. We got to really do stuff. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> and then I'm going to, that's it. I've made, I'm making a commitment. I've thought about this. I'm making a commitment. And then boom, let's, let's. You know what? I'm going to make a commitment. Starting today, everything that I do in LA, and again, I don't go out that often, but everything that I do, any store that I enter, I'm not going to wear a mask. And if I'm told to wear a mask, then if I need to get in there, I guess I will. Like, I'm not here to start a riot and fight with people. What happened to your political commitment to stand up to Hitler? Huh? I thought that's what, or like, you know, we're, we're all the Frankenstein of Hitler, right? Together as the pro mask wearing society. Like, come on, Dave. I thought that you were a true believer. I thought you were a true revolutionary. Go in there. And even if that Walmart employee or He's probably going to what crate and barrel even if that crate and barrel employee tells you to put your mask on you've got to stand up against tyranny well not gonna get kicked out and he's joining crossfit those two things together i uh, love that it's just like a perfect encapsulation of <laughs> of how performative and cowardly he is hilarious hilarious um let's go to the ims i, I just love it like uh, i'm I, i've made i've i'm making a commitment right now I'm not going to wear a mask unless it prevents me from going in and, you know, going into the Banana Republic or whatever it is that I got to go into. Uh, Matt, the speaker in London is a rapper by the name of Low Key. His song, Free Palestine, is what originally brought uh, my attention to the situation years ago. It was my political wake-up call. Well, excellent. Um, Ooh, I'm a victim of conservative cancel culture. I referred to Israel as an apartheid state on Facebook, and someone called my job trying to get me fired by saying I was anti-Semitic. 
Thankfully, my boss saw my post and believes in basic human rights for Palestinians, so I'm safe. Oh, that's good. There you go. And that was John Oliver. That was his um, the IGN see his, staff. his piece. Damn. Oh, yeah, exactly. I didn't see it yet. What, what are you saying? Was it good? It was so good. He just did this brilliant take. I mean, it wasn't anything that we, but he's so, he's so good at explaining things. And you know what risk that was to, to go all in. And then at the end, it was interesting because I thought the best part was at the end and he buried the lead, but maybe it was intentional. That's when he went all in against Biden. Like, what the F are you doing? Have some courage. There we go. I mean, I'm, I'm Money. I heard good things, but I'm excited to watch it, honestly, which is odd to, to say because I'm not a huge John Oliver person, but like, you know, I guess credit where it's due for sure. Why don't people like him? Is it just because he's he's on HBO? I really, I every time I watch him, I think he does a great job. Am I missing something? Uh, he, uh, occasional not. Latin America coup issues, I feel like. I can't remember specific instances, but that's generally the area that he gets in trouble. I think people just got sick of the like sort of owning Trump through the media thing too, which he was kind of the originator of. And but like, he was just, good just at got it. Stale. He was yeah. good at it. It just got like, oh, this is hopeless. Yeah. Yeah, and also there's an. an I, I genuinely I know that like well maybe it's because of the COVID the way his show's been in COVID without the studio audience. I get like annoyed by the jokes. It, it, it distracts from where we're going. Like I I I there, I don't find them funny. And I anyway. Yeah, there is one part where he talks about the memification, how Israel put out basically memes about the bombs and, and the attacks. It was very funny, but not it just disrupted everything. I agree. There, He did say, though, like, I think this is why it, it, it had he, he was able to do this in his own little way, was just like, what the fuck's wrong with America? I'm from the UK, like, none of us are thinking this way, and maybe that's why he was able to get away, get away with it. Yeah. I don't know. It's worth watching. No, definitely. I want to. Um... Interview ideas. Uh, did you get my new email sent yesterday? Yes, I did. We will look into it. Appreciate it. Also, three of you know any genuine examples of conservatives being genuinely canceled in a problematic way? Easy to pick on weak examples. Wonder if there's at least one strong example. I, I'm look. I'm sure there are people getting canceled as to whatever that means. I'm not sure, but um, I have no problem with like. I mean, I don't know what what specifically it means. But I don't have a problem with people saying, like, I'm not going to support your projects anymore. Um, and of corporations saying, like, we're not going to associate ourselves with this individual. That, I mean, that's just that's just capitalism. And um, and I have, you know, my issues with capitalism are not that uh, that, you know, these things are responsive to the market. They're they're much more broader. Like, like I don't th this the canceling that is supposedly happening. Now, I don't think people should be accused of something they didn't do, but the canceling that they cry about constantly is really just people criticizing them and saying, we don't, or, or, or I don't like your ideas and I don't want to be associated with them. And this has been going on forever. It's just that it's got a name now because there is more um, opportunity for people outside of the power centers to exert this power. You didn't, you know, like, like we didn't call it cancel culture when Juan Cole didn't get his um, uh, tenure at Yale. And that story was just one that we knew about, but uh, how many of these do, do uh, these stories happen and have been ongoing? I mean, just people going in and applying for jobs. They're not going to get a job because the, the way that the person looks or the way the per I mean, you, you, up until a uh, court case a couple of months ago, you could be denied housing and uh, a job if you were gay. How is that not cancel culture? I, How is, I mean, you, if you're if you're trans, you'd be denied housing. How is that not cancel culture? They're not being shamed, Sam. That's through policy. People aren't paying attention to policy. That's the difference. Here's the examples the Washington Times give. You can stop me if you think any of these is genuine. Uh, number one, Mike Lindell. I will move on. Uh, number two, Chris Harrison, the, the longtime host of The Bachelor. Um, yeah, uh, well, I think he's back after <laughs> expert here. Pretty sure he's going to be back after this latest season. So I don't know how canceled he is. Okay, then J.K. Rowling, of course. 
Adam Rubenstein. How is J.K. Rowling canceled? <laughs> I know. Also, she's not even a conservative. Like she's a yeah, she's a a turf. Like I mean, she's a limousine liberal lady. But I mean, whatever. She could publish a book tomorrow, and do you think she wouldn't get published? What is this real? Like, yeah, she's not the richest woman in the world. Yes, yeah, I'd probably okay. around there. Gina Carano. Um, I don't know if she's a total richest, but she's very very rich. Tucker Carlson, Sean Hannity, Laura. Number six is all these three: Tucker, oh, Hannity, and Ingram. They all have shows. No, Highest canceled. rated shows on cable news. They've not been canceled. Number seven, Matt Iglesias. Number eight, Washington, Lincoln, and Jefferson. Uh, number oh. nine, Senator Josh Hawley. Number 10, Goya Foods. So I don't think there is a real example. <laughs> Josh Hawley. I, it's just, it's just, it's just, it's, you know, like the, and, and to focus on these excesses when there is so much uh, examples of of other people being canceled across the board. I mean, it's just bizarre. Ap Apniva, shout out to Brandon Sutton et al. for a really fantastic episode of The Discourse today. Uh, great. That's great. Were there any other shows that were great today, too? Hmm. Um, we were throwing a curveball. Apniva. It's remarkable how dumb Glenn Beck is and how he doesn't understand his own analogy. Were he to simply think about what he is bloviating, it's clear that wearing a mask is wearing a swastika armband, not that not wearing a mask is a yellow star. But the central thrust is not that liberals are Nazis. It's that Glenn and Dave are the victims. Uh, John Oliver is digestible by my liberal parents. Chabruska, how serious is Biden about climate change? What are some of the proposed policies? The biggest one is having... Um, Having uh, the uh, uh, fossil fuels, having the amount of fossil fuel consumption by 2030, that's the biggest proposal, broadly speaking. Uh, and then that there's sort of like uh, sub proposals at that point, like electric cars and uh, renewables with the U.S. government just okayed the I mean, do I know, think it's sufficient? I don't know. There was a report out today by um, the International um and is it energy association who where is that bear with me one second folks i can't find it uh i'll, I'll dig it up uh oh here it is international energy agency um nations around the world would need to immediately stop approving new coal-fired power plants and new oil and gas fields and 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 biden hasn't been great with that um, and quickly phase out gasoline power vehicles if they want to avert the most catastrophic effects of climate change. That is according to the IEA issuing a new report. By the fracking industry. Is it? I don't know, but anybody who's like, who puts the, the burden on cars is, is not uh, the, the biggest cause. Well, I'm not going to go down the rabbit hole, but for instance, in New York, the biggest, New York City alone, the biggest cause of emissions comes from uh, the gas that's being leaked out through buildings that are not, I mean, there was just a piece of legislation that just passed, thank God, uh, essentially, you know, retrofitting and banning uh, gas from being used in future. Um, I don't know. I, I mean, th they're also saying that they need to uh, stop approving any new oil um, or uh, gas fields. Um, I, I don't know for sure. I was just saying, I was making a joke because oftentimes they're pitted against each other. But what's interesting about that, I think, is um, 2030 seems like, okay, too little, too late. But what it does is it signals, and this is already happening with, with these um, oil companies in particular, oil and gas companies, it signals to them that they have to start shifting their business model. And it's already happening. And so, you know, one of the most uh, revealing conversations uh, I'll have with like environmental activists and, and scientists is the industry is shifting by these big things that we think are not, not soon enough because they have to start 10 years earlier. Yes. And, and in fact, this came up in my conversation with Andreas mom, uh, who is a, um, uh, European climate activist. And, and he, 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 he believes uh, quite strongly that we need to add into this mix um, essentially sabotage of, 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 of oil fields, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, he's not looking for any type of violence against people, uh, but he is, he's talking about sabotaging this. And it's part of that is essentially similar dynamic. Eco-terrorism, is that what you're saying? 
No, uh, he's saying sabotaging uh, infrastructure because um, it's not about, uh, uh, you know, changing the political ideology. It is essentially what you're saying. When they come out with a policy that says have emissions by 2030, get rid of emissions by 2050, this becomes a, uh, a disincentive for people to invest in these corporations and uh, to maintain their investment and their shareholder value. They need to make moves that say we're preparing for this, what appears to be an eventuality. And from his perspective, you can enhance that dynamic by also diminishing returns that people get because you're making the cost of business that much more expensive. So if, you know, getting that uh, barrel of oil out of the ground costs $60 instead of $30, that's going to be the biggest vehicle to change. He said the real problem is not that we don't have the technology to go fully sustainable. The problem is it's not profitable. <laughs> and so they are chasing the profits. And the only way that you can deal with that is by making the other uh, endeavors less profitable. And the one. What, what do you mean by sabotage, though? I, I, I guess, is, are you talking about like colonial pipeline sabotage or? Um, I don't know if he would say uh, a pipeline necessarily, but he was talking about, yeah, he was talking about, yeah, like. Hackers of the world unite. Probably more, uh, probably more about um, uh, either refining capacity or uh, drilling would be my guess. But when you say sabotage, what does the act of sabotage look like? Is it hacking? I mean, I'm not saying you're advocating for it. Let's make this a very legal. Uh, damage of that's... property, I would imagine. Probably okay. damage of property so that it may... is ego terrorism. Well, I don't think that I don't think damage of property is terrorism. Well, classically defined in terms of like what I was trying to understand. Definition. But um, but it is, I mean, I don't. I mean, I think terrorism is a specific thing, right? I mean, it's like. It, I mean, not... at least Mandela delineates between terrorism and like sabotage in his. Uh, I mean, it yeah. is sabotage. I mean, that's what it is. It's not, I mean, terrorism has to do with scaring civilians and changing ideology by terrorizing a population. You're not terrorizing anybody. What you're doing is you're trying to make the cost of doing business higher so that the profit margin is, 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 is smaller. And the investment that people make into these businesses and into these oil rigs becomes riskier. That's all. That's not terrorism. No, I agree with you. I'm just in terms of I didn't understand what you meant by sabotage. I just wanted clarification. Talking about um, a physical plant, uh, you know, sabotage. It's exact. I mean, it's, it's almost definitionally. That's what it is. Sabotage. Um, and I think there's a, um, I mean, I wouldn't advocate it only because, um, you know, uh, lawsuits, uh, lawsuits, uh, litigation, but I'm saying as a theoretical argument, I think, um, it's an interesting argument. I mean, certainly it, it, it what it, what it, what it does as an argument is it really shows what the, what the name of the game is. And that is within the context of the system that we have in this world, I'm sure there are regimes that we could live under or, uh, organize you know, uh, uh, economic uh, ways of organizing ourselves economically that were different, that would be more helpful. But in, in terms of the way it exists now, it has to be made more expensive, less profitable for people to invest in these technologies that are killing the planet. Simultaneous. Go, go ahead. I'm sorry. Uh, like I feel like the context of World War II wasn't there all sorts of examples of like um, like factory workers sabotaging equipment. Um, like for instance, the Nazis like say we don't want this bomb to explode, so we're going to actually sabotage it. Um, oh yeah, there were um, there were Nazis. Uh, there were there were people working in um, in uh, German factories who would um, would do stuff like uh, sabotage the planes and this and that. I mean. It's a slightly different calculation, right? I mean, because the uh, the the Nazis aren't necessarily doing, uh, you know, building these war machines for. I mean, as the proximate cause being to make profit. This is just basically like, I mean, 
it's why they have lobbyists. It's because it's their insurance policy be to be, you know, to defend against public policy that ends up making their jobs, uh, their their way of making money less profitable. But if you add into the mix that if you're going to invest in drilling in Anwar, your returns are not uh, as, uh, you know, the range of return that you anticipate from that investment may not be what it is because there are people out there who are going to go up to Anwar and they're going to tip these things over. I mean, that's basically it. And then does that make us more reliant on oil in countries where we can't uh, do these types of actions like what what it does is it, it no because the there's there's a certain amount of capacity in which to produce this and uh, suddenly becomes just more viable to create sustainable energy. I mean, ultimately, the, the uh, you know the the value of nationalizing energy production is that is in my mind a function of the fact that once you build those solar panels. There's really no more profit, I mean, to, to be squeezed out of it. Once you build those windmills and you put them up, this is not an ongoing, right. you know, uh, way of generating profit. And because this is one of those instances where the profit motive, and there's many instances like this, but this is a pretty important one relative to the, um, to the uh, uh, sustainability of the world. There's not enough profit. There's not enough incentive for the private sector to make these moves at this point. And so you nationalize uh, energy production, and then all of a sudden it's the ob most obvious thing in the world to make it all sustainable because it's the cheapest version. It's the cheapest version of it. So, Sam, I'm sitting here in Puerto Rico right now, and like, well, this all makes sense on a national level. They're privatizing the power grid right now here. There are massive protests over that. They're telling all of these uh, you know, workers for PREPA, which is the, the public, uh, to go and become like nurses and teachers. Like, just, just go retrain yourself, meaning there's, by the way, a shortage of nurses. It's, there are no schools. They're all being shut down, and, and the hospitals are being shut down. So, so that's happening. But simultaneously, there's an actual conversation about fracking on this island that has had a major earthquake two years ago. Well, there's a major solar movement happening here. So, you know, that makes sense, but, but the profit motive, they're still gonna see it. They're still gonna see an opportunity to make money. I mean, this, this, this is an island right now, it's completely under control of a fiscal control board that's, that's dominated by hedge funds. All it is is about making money, even though what better case could be an island that had no power and is moving to solar, and instead they're thinking, no, we want to frack, and uh, we're, we've completely privatized this, the, the power grid. I don't know. I mean, it's a little ecosystem, but it is representative of what's happening everywhere. Well, yes. I mean, I, I, and, and that's why I think, you know, uh, Andreas Malm would argue, um, well, when they set up that first fracking drill, tip it over. I'm just using that as an example. I don't know how one would go about doing that, but you tip it over. And they go like, oh, wait a second. Now we're going to have to pay double the cost. Then all of a sudden the profitability goes down. And if there is in it just simply an awareness, if you attempt this, it's going to be far more expensive than you think it is. Uh, the profit, the, the, then it's harder to just get investment. I mean, and that's, you know. Uh, Unless you're the governor who also has his hand in that pot. <laughs> still, still, it's still just as hard because the governor doesn't have the cash. You need to, you need to borrow an extraordinary amount of money to set up an oil field. And the way you do that is you, your collateral, essentially, your argument to the bank or to whoever's lending you the money is that you're going to lend me, I don't know, I'm just pulling numbers out of my ass here, a billion dollars to build uh, you know, this oil field. And here are the projections we have of our costs and our revenue. And so we're going to make over the next 10 years out of that billion dollars, $18 billion. And so we'll be able to pay you back the money we wanted at this interest rate. And, but if the bank or the lender goes like, well, wait a second, you're telling me you're going to make it, your revenue is going to be $18 billion. But with all of these uh, sabotage that's going on or, and, or 
federal uh, laws that are going to come on the books or appear that they might be or the million people who are marching whatever in uh you know uh in, in florida you know i'm just a hypothetical uh, marching in florida are going to create the pressure to uh restrict your um you know you're going to actually have to have all these different mechanisms on that oil field your your revenue might be 18 billion dollars supposedly but your costs are going to be closer to 17 billion rather than the 8 billion that you you claim it's going to be and we're afraid we're not going to get our money back and so we're going to you know jack up the interest rate or we're going to not loan you as much money and it's going to inhibit the ability of this company to build those rigs i mean that's the dynamic and and so there is value when biden says by 2030 we're going to do this because if people believe him even if that's not sufficient on a perspective of changing uh you know the course of climate change in and of itself these other people are going to operate up based upon what they think their profit's going to be or it's going to inhibit their ability to raise money to engage in these activities and it's going to it's not you know the market doesn't sort out well you get to do it and they don't they all take a defensive position and so you saw this with the freaking light bulbs like you know the government says by by you know five years out the light bulbs have to be like this and the light bulb industry but we can't do it but we can't do it you know and then you know all the conservatives are like well i demand a certain you know color uh, temperature on my lights and blah 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 and then you know five years later all of a sudden it's like Damn, these LEDs are actually uh, soft white in the same way. Or Trump these... rolled that back, though, didn't he? Is, uh, do we have any news on that? But the point is, the right. companies made the moves on their own. So all of a sudden, like, you don't even need the, um, the, the requirements. It's just uh, the, the, the companies have responded because they anticipated and th they assumed this would be the regulatory environment. And so they changed what they were doing anyways. And we just got better uh, light bulbs. Cheaper, more efficient. End of story. So. Are you advocating for market-based solutions? No. I'm, advocating. I'm kidding. For government influencing market -based. I'm just. Well, I'm saying that that is one of the impacts yes, yes. Of, of government. But that is why it just get back to the masks, right? Like, you don't want any government action. You don't want any collective action because it works. And it inhibits their narrative that like, you know, government's bad. You want everything to be like the DMV? I don't know, can you imagine like how much it would cost for you to get a license for a private industry to do? I mean, I mean, just contemplate this for a moment. Like, can you imagine privatizing the DMV? And I mean, I mean, genuine private. Let the private, <clears throat> the private sector regulate who gets to drive, under what conditions, state to state, city to city, the roads, the, uh, um, the stop signs. The, I mean, it's just, it's just bizarre. You would not, like, this, the, the, the subway system in New York used to be uh, privatized. Yeah. And which is why, in many respects, it's like insufficient in a lot of places because you had these individual operators operating on what were their own best interests as opposed to what was in the best entrance of the development and the the health of the city well i mean it's just the the under development of subway lines and areas that don't include in the all the other boroughs except manhattan <laughs> and the signals are like 110 years old i mean that 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 guru from from the uk from london like he was the guy who was supposed to fix it and he quit and like a and there was such a press you know, it was, it was, it was, he's the guy, like the master of subways. And he just was like, I, I give up. I can't deal. That was something that I do with Cuomo too, but that was a Cuomo thing. Yeah, yeah. I mean, he was planning to stay. That was a Cuomo thing. Andy, uh, what was his name? Andy something. Yeah. And, um, but the, the, you know, they had to, they had to standardize everything, uh, because they had all worked, you know, had different lines and stuff like this. Um, so, but, you know, just just starve them and make sure that the MTA board, which is the, the public transportation board, is just full of real estate developers whose interests are in, uh, I don't know, uh, shutting down subways in neighborhoods that just happen to be uh, prime, prime for 
making sure they're starved of, of, of traffic so they can come in and buy up all the property and develop. Yep. Just, just, they're, not, they're not connected at all. Just put some real estate developers on the board of the MTA. All good. Marazco, is a two-state solution possible at this point? I, I, it, it seems to me that it's not. I mean, there is no two state. It's one state and a sliver. Yeah, I, I, I just don't know how that would happen at this point. But, um, no. Didn't, didn't Jared Kushner say um, he's been studying up on how to do that? Yeah. Is that his line? <laughs> all this by now? Trance warfare. Israel appears to have damaged the building of the Palestinian Children's Relief Fund in one of their targeted strikes, as well as allegedly taking out the only place in Gaza capable of processing COVID tests. Yes. Yes. I heard the latter anyways. Uh, The last I am of the day, the Israeli government knows it's not. How asymmetrical the conflict is, the symmetrical conflicts, missile campaigns are much more calculated and focused on potential retaliation. But Israel is so flippant about where and when they launch strikes. It's horrific. Euro poor. Uh, judge appointments in New York State are notoriously corrupt. Get lawyer Matthew on the show to share how he's able to live with himself and whatever he had to do to get nominated. Well, it's not an appointment. It's just a nomination in the town. Uh, Way to I, yuck his young. Yeah, no kidding. Dude. I think he's, I mean, he's, he's a lawyer and he's jovial. And I think he's also like... Um, Seems like a good guy, so... Well, he's also, I think, like young. I think like there is a, you know, in this town, it's like... They want somebody who's actually able to walk into the courthouse. And, uh, but uh, Jake Roberts, did you notice uh, in Rick Schroeder's video, he never says if he's vaccinated. The new CDC guidance only applies to fully vaccinated people. He is a snake. Did, of you, course. did you see that poll of uh, congressional representatives? Um, so, Nomi, it was something like one, it, it highlighted two things. Every single congressional Democrat in the Senate and in the house has been vaccinated uh for you're on mute by the way 48 per, <laughs> 48 percent of uh or no 48 out of 50 of the uh senate republicans have been vaccinated and it's something like 96 house republicans Wait, yeah. who are the two senators <laughs> i'm gonna guess Rand paul and josh holly i don't know i mean it's anonymous but uh it's anonymous I, I wonder, because I think it was an internal, you know, poll of the of the workplace, essentially. But um, it, one, it, it shows the divide between the Democrats and Republicans based on the total. And two, it also shows the difference between Senate Republicans and House Republicans. I mean, that's just nuts. Yeah. God. And they've had the ability. Imagine having to work with, with those a-holes. I mean, honestly, like, it just. Uh, like, they got their vaccine doses in January. That was, I mean, December maybe yeah. even. I remember my my you know my sweet mom was like, oh, I like that AOC, but I wish she didn't get the vaccine one before old people did. Like, oh my god. <laughs> well, the other aspect of this is how much of a sociopath. I mean, there's there's a lot of Republicans who are like, yeah, as soon as they have access to the vaccine, they're going to take it. We just know it's like a facade, but uh, <laughs> they're believing it. They yeah. believe it. I mean, the senator, I just don't, who is it? Who are those two senators? I want to know. Let's take a bet. Um, yeah. I also think it's possible that two of them lied. Even even if they're not. Uh, Be yeah, well, because, I mean, look. If you're one of them, you could be thinking that, like, you know what? In two or three years, I might want to be able to say I didn't take the vaccine. Lie? I doubt. Oh, oh, I see what you're saying. Like, and yeah, because it's. Yeah, I mean, you know, and so now, you know, they can cu- cut it either way. Uh, yeah, no, I did take the vaccine or I didn't take the vaccine. Like, they're, they're lunatics. Train boy, very sad to hear that the Mossad, in conjunction with CNN and David Pakman, nuked Mark Lamont's Hill's internet connection before you could interview him. Some positive news is that, according to my doctor, I am healing ahead of schedule. The blood work I had done yesterday revealed that the cancer marker in my blood is less than 10% of what it was before the surgery. I'm so glad to hear that. I'm giving you one of these. Uh, Alexis, uh, uh, Alex JS485. Uh, I know Sam has a background in law and, and this frames his arguments in that way. But in my mind, the notion of discussing what is happening in Palestine in terms of international law is farcical. 
There is no basis for it because there really is no such thing as international law. There is only power. I mean, Chomsky is clear on this. America is the strongest country in the world. And until it stops supporting Israel like it stopped uh, supporting South Africa, law will not matter. Oh, no, no. I, I, I think you misinterpreted my, my point. Um, the value of going to the ICC could be simply a public opinion one. And to the extent that there's any um, uh, power that people have, it's really just in public opinion and forcing uh, it become a, too costly of a decision for um, their elected leaders to do X, Y, or Z. What I was saying is that these ICC um, uh, complaints are not going to end up having that um, um that effect because I anticipate there not being a very sort of clear winner in there coming out of it. And so it wasn't going to have the public opinion impact that one would want. That's my point. The international law is really just, you know, when you make those, when everybody cases, decides that they're going to go along with it, that's yeah, basically, but when it. you make those cases, it's also not necessarily, yeah, it, that's not something, you know, as leftists, we're probably going to be, leaning on but also when you say that it appeals to a certain kind of audience oh well, without a doubt that may I mean, that may not be predisposed to looking at the conflict in um the right way if they find out it's violating international law maybe you can you know sway some kind of like this came up with, with nora eckhart uh, erica right i mean she was talking about uh she's written about uh the law international law being used as a tool of the movement as opposed to one that is actually going to have in and of itself material impact. Yeah. So you take cases that you're going to lose because the value of these cases is in demonstrating power dynamics and in, in changing public opinion. That is the way that you use the law in these type of situations, not because you anticipate that it's going to, you know, somebody's going to come down there with an injunction uh, and say, hey, wait a second, you can't uh, ethnically cleanse <laughs> because I've got an injunction here. Um, Alex JS, the subway system being privatized is also why the letter line cars are different in size than the number line cars. They're not standardized, and that's why the system is so balkanized. Thanks for explaining your international law argument. Oh, that was quick. No. Um, and also, uh, Morales did not come out of any movement. That's the problem. There is such a difference between people who are simply endorsed or looking for an endorsement and those who come out of a movement. Uh, Wales, not England. Wales is not England. I knew that. Uh, is it true that Israeli government is targeting doctors at home and on roads, hospitals to Gaza rather than bombing hospitals directly reported on Twitter? I, I, I don't know. I don't know. I have no way of knowing. Uh, Zlatovolos, is the Obama brand starting to decline among Democrats? I listened to his speech recently and was nauseated by how decrepit his politics are. I feel like they must a little bit uh, be, be declining. I mean, I think even the Biden administration sort of took a knock or two at, at the, the Obama people. Um, nerd. They don't remember that stuff either. They don't remember the differences between most people, you know, he'll still appear on stage with Obama. It's yep. more like what's, well, there was that poll that came out um, a couple of days ago. I'm um, not that it's a surprise to us in terms of how much more progressive those under 40 are and how it's shifting every aspect of U.S. politics. So I don't think they have a choice. Uh, Brown Bag Sam, Vouch's charity stream is only 12,000 away from the goal uh, for the Palestinian Children's Relief Fund. I believe that's what PCRF is for. If you feel so inclined to donate, please do so. Check it out, folks. Um, nerd cheetah on the you don't duck questions admiration of the I am or yesterday I have to say I admire your clarity on most issues as a father teacher rural New Yorker lefty but you duck and twirl around dem rigging corruption losing strategically on purpose to please donors guess it's the turd versus the toilet water choice you've accepted which means maybe you're sharper than me guess that's why I watch um, I, I, I don't know that I duck and twirl around Dem. Well, I mean, I don't accept the rigging uh, argument on some level, but the corruption, the losing strategically. I mean, look, I just I think that the the 
it is a... Um, it's too simple to say it's losing strategically. I mean, it's like about well, what so, races they allocate resources to, which candidates they put up for which races. Right. I also just, I just genuinely like have a a a problem with the generality of, of saying Dem losing strategically. For instance, Joe Manchin doesn't want to change the filibuster because Joe Manchin doesn't want certain change and he doesn't want to vote against it. He doesn't want to vote for it. Right. But um, Brian Schatz, you know, wants to. <laughs> and so like, you know, and who's the Democratic Party in this situation? I actually think that it's conceivable. And I don't know. I actually think that that Biden probably would want to get rid of the um, the filibuster because he knows that his future is a function of that and his legacy is a function of getting rid of that. But I think that Joe Manchin doesn't. So who's the Democratic Party there? Who do you give? I mean, it's still Joe Biden because God forbid Joe Biden be the president and stronghold a senator and, you know, put on his, you know, LBJ pants. Yeah, I'm but sorry. I just, the buck stops at Joe Biden. He runs the party. He runs everything. And Kamala Harris wants a future in politics too. So... You know, sorry. Well, no, no, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not letting Joe Biden off the hook for this. But I'm just saying, who in this calculation? Maybe, but you're saying, but what you're making an argument is not intent. You're making an argument about 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 efficacy and skill and this and that. I mean, look, God knows what resources LBJ had back in that era that um, that you don't have today, right? Like, you know. Uh, It'd be a real shame if your wife found out about what, you know, we've been doing down at the blankety blank club, wouldn't it? You know, uh, but, you know, a hoss, you know, that type of crap. I mean, I, I don't know. <laughs> Honestly, I mean, I would imagine there was a, a lot more of that type of shit then that you could I get. I think there's more of it now. What are you talking about? Back then, the press didn't even cover that stuff. How often did you hear about a scandal coming up? Never. Now it's like, make one move. We'll smear you. We'll lie. We'll do whatever. I don't know. I, I, I it's cancel culture guys. Come on. I will cancel your ass if you don't do this. But do you think that Joe Biden's desire is to have the filibuster removed? No, you don't. I don't. I think he's frozen. I think if you have, if, if any of you have ever been in a relationship with somebody and you're at a standstill. You're going in the wrong direction. You're, Sam's like, don't do it. Don't do it. Um, in any type of relationship. <laughs> you never talk about your relationships on here. You know what I mean? Like, like you're just like, you don't know what to do and just freeze. You're like, I, I still love the person, but I like, I know it's not the right direction. That is where everything, and that's actually the opening of my show today, is about the Biden doctrine, which is frozen. I don't know how to quit you, Netanyahu, and still give you eight and then a wink, wink, not not. It's the times are changing, things are shifting. The neoliberal strategy is not set up for crises. And right now we're at a crisis, which means you have to deal with the filibuster. And he is on a, I mean, it is, he's, he's, it's just because he comes from a different era. And Johnson came from a different era. Do you think that if, uh, if Joe Manchin were to vote for the, uh, to get rid of the filibuster, that Joe Biden would, would be, uh, happy or unhappy with that turn of events? I think he would just be like, okay, moving forward. I don't think he has, I think he's, he's naturally inclined to support the filibuster because he is of that era of the Senate and he is conditioned by neoliberal policies. But the future, but, 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 but he would have in to, which he has to set policies, right? Go ahead. He would have to basically resign himself to like, I'm done. I, mean, I don't know about I, I. I don't know if I agree. But how could he possibly think that he's going to get anything done without uh, uh, with the filibuster? There's plenty of things he can get done without exactly bipartisanship, uh, the power of the pen. There's plenty of things he can still get done without the filibuster. With with the filibuster. Like um, you know, he's not he's not going out there and taking that administrative a you know the actions. Sorry, I'm on mute. That's exactly the point. I think that ultimately he's 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 still like first off, he's old as f. No, I he knows how 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 mentally you know this is not the Joe Biden who fought with Hillary Clinton in the Situation Room about Iraqi policy. You it's not him. You're talking about something different than what I'm talking about. I'm asking, mm -hmm. do our Joe Manchin and Joe Biden's uh, agendas aligned? 
I think this is the difference, Sam. You seem to believe that, or, or for my interpretation, I don't know what you believe, but for my interpretation, you seem to believe that they have some sort of moral compass. The moral compass is opportunity, and they're completely conditioned by the power dynamics of the last 40 years, which are shifting. And the problem is, is that they don't know, Joe Biden himself does not know how to operate from a place of, of, of courageous leadership in, in cutting the ties to the power dynamic. You, you end that filibuster, you change the entire power, power dynamic of the Senate, and using the Republicans holding up legislation that he doesn't want to pass. All right, let me ask you this then. Let me ask you this, because I feel like we're talking past each other. Okay. I don't think that they have moral compasses. I think they're completely devoid of it, but that's not the same as having an agenda, right? So does Joe Manchin have an agenda? Yes. Okay, does Joe Biden have an agenda? Doesn't know yet. The question of my show, great lead in guys, is what is Joe Biden's doctrine? He doesn't know yet. He is stuck between two worlds and can't seem to, I mean, the fact that you have Ron Klain and Neera Tandon and Kamala Harris doing board, they don't know who they are and they don't understand. They're not, they're not ready to quit the old world yet. Okay, okay. To move into the new world that they have to address because of crisis. Not because of us, frankly, guys, a little bit because of us, but mainly because of crisis. Okay, so Manchin has an agenda. Joe Biden doesn't have an agenda. Definitionally, if he doesn't know what it is, he doesn't have one. Okay, right? I mean, a firm, firm agenda, I should say. I don't know. I'm not in his head. I don't know what's going on with Ron Klain. I mean, maybe Ron Klain has an agenda. They want to deal with the here. This is it. This is this is the agenda that I've been able to pick up. They want to be able to deal with the crisis, but keep appease the corporate interests that and the foreign interests that have sustained them for 35, 40 years. The neoliberal, uh, like, like keep them like go just as far as they need to go is whatever the agenda is is joe manchin's agenda aligned with joe biden's probably 75 percent but it's that 25 percent that's you know if you get rid of the filibuster you suddenly open up the floodgates for all the other stuff okay. that joe biden may not be ready for who is the democrats joe biden or joe manchin joe biden okay so that's my point there, right? Is like, that was all I was trying to get at. Is, know, it was fun. Is that, is that it, is a, uh, it is a category error to simply say Democrat, um, you know, rigging or, or Democratic losing strategically. Some people are looking to lose strategically. Like Mark Warner is a guy who I think you could say like, we're going to lose this fight and I'm going to make like I'm pretending like I want to have this fight. That's the type of guy that, that I think you could say that about. He has more power. It's easier to lose in those situations than it is to win. He has, uh, you know, simply because of the dynamic. So that's just the only, like, you know, and I guess to that sense, you can perceive that as ducking and twirling, but it's really just about, you know, the fact is the Democratic Party is, you know, a coalition party made up of, like, I don't know, 60% corporatists, 40% corporatists, 70% corporatists, whatever you want to, however you want to assess what, what that breakdown is. Um, and, uh, you know, 20% uh, folks who are like, uh, you know, FDR Democrats, 30%, I don't know. But the point is, is like, it's not, there are power centers or, 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 or centers that could be more powerful that can occasionally win some of these battles. So it doesn't make sense to me to say, you want to say the DNC was in favor of Hillary Clinton? Yes, that makes sense. You also got to assess like how much power do they have in the outcome of an election? You know, some, but not that much in my estimation. Uh, I would flip that and reverse it. I would say they have more power than you think, and it's not the whole DNC. It's the majority of the membership, but it's still not the whole thing. Okay. That's, that's what I would say. But my point is, is that it, it yeah. is a category error to sort of just like. But that's why leadership matters, right? Nancy Pelosi knows very well which members she can let get away with certain things because they need she needs to keep her majority, right? If that's what she wants in that moment. But it's coming from Nancy Pelosi. You know, it's it's you know, she knows that she can let AOC do her thing to a point. There's some things she can't do it. Um, and she can, and, and she can let, uh, I don't know, pick some conservative Democrat. I can't think of right now. Uh, Tom Swazi, 
you know, like literally like a half a mile away from AOC's district, do his thing as a conservative Democrat because it overlaps, it's, it's Long Island and they need to keep that seat and they're not losing it. So the powers, the, that's why the leadership matters. That's why it is Joe Biden's party. It is Nancy Pelosi's party and is Chuck Schumer's Senate. You know, they're the ones who hold the operational force that everybody else is beholden to. So it's Jamie Harrison's party because at the end of the day, he can nullify any sort of decisions that come out of the membership. He can appoint whoever he wants to the rules committee to interpret the rules or set the rules for the next election. So these leadership positions do matter and that's who the party is in my opinion. Even if you join the DNC, you know very well, your hands are tied as long as it's uh, Jamie Harrison who's in charge. All right, fair and enough. not Keith Ellison. But I don't think those, like, I, I think, yeah, there is something, like, the Tom Perez-Keith Ellison fight, I think, was indicative of a certain power struggle that I, whatever it's there needs to be removed from the Democratic Party, but I don't think it wants to lose. I think it wants to win their way, and if and it's fine losing if it, they don't win their way, but. I do not think that Tom Perez had any interest in winning state legislatures over. He didn't put any, he put barely any money into it. There was a real fight about it. There were promises. People know what the strategy to win is in the Democratic Party, and there was plenty of money to do it. I think it was to reward the cronies who sat on the Rules Committee and got all the contracts. So I do think that their agenda was to just make money. Lose, right. win, whatever. Right, make exactly. Money. Yeah. Not uh, to lose. <laughs> Fat J, rest in peace, Charles Grodin. Sorry to hear that. Um, he was uh, a comedic. He's an actor, but he did some comedy. He did um, uh, what was that uh, one he did with De Niro? Uh, some Midnight Run was it? That mm -hmm. one of his, you know, sort of uh, bigger. But he did. I actually read his autobiography at one point, which was it would be so nice if you weren't here anymore. I mean, he was an ass. I think as a, as a human being, but he was a funny person to read talk about himself uh and a good actor uh jj cool oh he was also in uh um uh i think it was he major major in catch 22 was he, he major catch, major i'm looking at it now he was in the heartbreak kid yeah he was in a lot of um iconic movies um sam from ottawa didn't the u.s warn iran of their middle strikes after trump killed one of the generals maybe yeah J well they we think um, Mark Twain. Oy, 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 oy. Um, that's too long. I can't read that. Black Marxist. Breyer's driving me insane with I'm not retiring because I want the court to be political. It's embarrassing that we let RBG fiasco happen in the first place. Will these bougie liberals ever learn? I, I mean, frankly, I mean, y yes, I think, I, I think, I don't know how we, you know, I don't know how we could have prevented that, but what what Breyer is doing is the um, oh yeah he was also in real life Charles Grodin which is one of my favorite movies it's an Albert Brooks, Brooks movie Breyer I don't think Breyer understands just how deeply narcissistic it is to say that we're not going to I don't want the court to be political I can save the court from being political even more than that exactly it is so deeply narcissistic. To think that what you do is more important and you have the ability to change the way that people perceive the court in that fashion by your continuing to. It's just so deeply narcissistic. I, I, I mean, honestly, it is. Um, it's 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 I, I think it's despicable, but. Even if someone accused him of like being political in the court, he could just say, I'm the oldest member of the court. I want to retire. But it's like, yes, it's like, I am so above. I am so above hiding what is in my essence, in my being, because I would know that I retired for political reasons. And that is why I can't retire because I know that I would retire for political reasons. I mean, that's what's so grotesque about it right because he could come out and say just like uh kennedy did and i got news for you there's no reporting to this impact but i would bet that uh kennedy negotiated his retirement in some fashion or another if maybe it was through a wink and a nod but uh brett kavanaugh doesn't end up on that list that had been highly developed and poured over for for years and jump on that list 
when that just by coincidence he happened to be the guy that uh, Kennedy wanted. The idea that Breyer couldn't say, I'm the oldest guy on the court, or I'm just an old guy, or I have, you know, health impact, I have cancer, uh, and uh, I can't be on the court, or I've, you know, had cancer and been, um, the idea that he can't say that because in his heart he would know is just the most narcissistic, it's like, it is the, you know, it's like everything that is odious about the idea of like, I'm not going to vote for the lesser of two evils because I'm not going to taint my, I'm going to taint my hand that touches that ballot by doing that. As odious as that is, this is like, I don't know, 300 million times worse. Like literally. You're allowing your own personal feeling of like, oh God. Um, Our Parappa, there's so much popular culture support for Palestine that Biden has made the politics calculation that it's in his best interest to defend Israel. I, I actually think that there probably is still, um, you know, a significant amount of popular support. I mean, you measure it. If you're a Democratic president, you, you look at, you know, Congress and you say, like, you know, they have a better sense of what their constituents want than I do uh, in this respect. And you look at the donors and, but I think that calculation is going to change in five or 10 years. All right. Four more of these Panda. Uh, hey, Sammy, any suggestions on helping my liberal friends get reengaged to the political process? Having lots of brunch itis going on since big bad is gone. That's a good question. I got to think about that more. I deal with it all the time. Gay Bowser. Vouch has raised over 210000 writing this and two hours left in his stream. Go donate for the Palestinian Children's Relief Fund. Been a great stream. If you don't, you're all Jimmy Dore stands. <laughs> all right. Two more and then we're out of here. Uh, HR Data Monkey. Matt's the Patrick Kane of Rocket League. And the final I am of the day. Let's see what we got here. Midwest Arab. This morning, the official government Israel Arabic Twitter account tweeted a photo of Gaza being bombed and captioned it with verses from the Quran about God destroying an army that was trying to attack Mecca before the Prophet Muhammad's time, using the Quran to say the Palestinians are an invading army that God is being destroyed. How is this sort of blatant blasphemy accepted? Um, I don't, I don't, I don't know. I don't know enough about this dynamic to even really Their accept. Their Twitter feed, have you been following it? Is unreal. Oh, 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 this is the Israeli government? Yes. Oh my gosh. It's horrifying. They've had memes. There was one where they just had rockets, rockets, rockets. And then they were like, no, no, no. We were actually showing the rockets that they fired at us. It's like, yeah, <laughs> I still don't think you get it. That's horrible. All right. Uh, Nomi, check out Nomi's show happening in 20 minutes. Brendan, Matt, good job today. See you tomorrow. It might take all the strength I got to get to where I want. But I know somehow I'm going to get there. I wasn't looking when I just got caught between the truth and the light bar. But finding out won't make me feel any better. Yeah, I know the clock is ticking, but the meds are going to kick in. And my pilot light's shining bright. I get somewhere the choice is made for the option where you don't get paid. For the road that bends before it finally breaks you. I get somewhere I lost my drive.